days. Yeah, I know. That's all right. I mean, I'm cool. I, uh, I'm just happy to be speaking to you, David. Even though, you know, uh, I, I heard the, the Oedipal remark uh, in the previous half hour. And All right. Well, that screwed up. Uh, yeah, we're having technical problems today. I apologize, it's all right. but I sound okay, right? Sound great. Sound great. Sound great. Damn this. Yeah. I have a feeling some of what you were talking about was lost. Oh, well, that's all right. Repeating <laughs> repetition is all. I know good. what I did wrong. I know what I did wrong. Oh. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, go, so what were you talking about? I apologize. Oh, just about, uh, you know, Obama talking about, uh, you know, the social media being the problem. It actually was a, it was a thoughtful speech. It's it seems like, OK, yeah, we, we, we kind of know this, Barack, but are you going to lead the way? Um, essentially, he's leading toward this idea of regulation of social media and he was trying to sell the idea that, hey, regulation is still possible or uh, innovation is still possible with regulation. Maybe, uh, but regulation always uh, sends the shivers up capitalist spines and makes them say, what does this have to do with shareholder value? Which is what right. the, the whole idea of Christian Smalls and why unions are a bad idea, you know, in the minds of CEOs at uh, big tech companies. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, it would, but it was interesting to see what ba Obama is going to do after, you know, post post presidency, you know, he puts up his library. What's he going to do with his time? This is what he's going to do. And of course there was a little diversity message. He wants to make sure that the tech companies include are inclusive and in who they deal with all the people of color. So in, in many ways it was kind of, what we'd hoped and expected from Obama all along, but haven't gotten. And so in many ways, you know, a typical react, the reaction you had is maybe kind of, yeah, like if you care about democracy, why don't you do something real? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a guest on a week or two ago who was bemoaning democracy. He's a Democrat, wrote a book about it. And I said, well, what do the Democrats have to offer? I said, how about like Medicare for all? He goes, well, I, I don't know if Medicare for all is the, is the answer. Uh, he says, I'm not so concerned about, you know, what the Democrats stand for as I am worried that the Republicans want to kill democracy. And I kind of said, well, doing nothing kills democracy. You got to give reason, you got to give people a reason to want a democracy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in some ways it's like, you know, or what's the first problem right in front of us? And I guess the Democrats see the Republican threat, but then that gets in the way of them offering something real. And, you know, and, and then there's this idea that if, as long as we stay as divided as we are, we're never going to have the kind of mandate or the kind of, um, you know, the, the kind of flexibility to really get something passed as we see when the, the, the numbers are so, so, so tight in the Senate, 50, 50, you got the tiebreaker. She's the Democrat. Um, it makes things not next to impossible, but it, given the circumstances of how divided we are, it's amazing that anything can, can get done. And yet we know if we look at history, we see how, Things like the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Voting Rights Act, immigration law, it all passed 1965. So roughly 50 years ago, all that stuff passed with, you know, with clear majorities. I mean, it was not like the, that, that was like a, a common thing. And now we just can't do anything. Our, 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 our democracy is so hindered. And um, so I, I suppose, what's preventing new ideas from coming up or the preservation of the ideas that we passed more than 50 years ago is the fact that, well, we got to get, 
we, we got to be able to see each other as, you know, uh, find some common ground amongst, you know, Democrats and Republicans and progressives and liberals and conservatives. And I think ultimately that's what Obama was trying to get at when he was talking about the problems with our, our, you know, are the divisions in our country that they are exacerbated by social media and exacerbated by the fact that we don't know how to talk to each other. And he does get into talking about the different silos that, that exist and how we need, you know, everything is nationalized on cable and on in the news because everyone wants the big audience. They want the big audience of money. And so what suffers local news, local information, grassroots information where it might, really make a difference in people's lives. And he did, he did make a comment that hey, we need to do something to revive local news. And that's where we met local news, local was everything. Right. And right now, you know, it's like local, um, don't make enough money with local. What is the, I, I do know that Republicans believe that Trump won. They really do. A, a majority of Republicans believe that Democrats are run by child molesters. I was just reading a YouGov, an economist YouGov poll that there are Republicans who believe that a majority of Republicans believe the Democratic Party is controlled by pedophiles. Yeah, it, it, this is really becoming a thing in our discourse. And that, that's why I'm very careful. I say my wife works a PETA and I love my wife. It makes me a pedophile, not a pedophile. I, I want to make sure that people, because right now, PETA, pedophilia is like the big villain. And, uh, you know, the, the idea, I mean, Jeffrey Epstein, every, it, the QAnon, everything. Every, it's ped, pedophilia has become such a thing. I was reading an editorial that uh, talked about you know the Camden Catholic Church uh, decision or settlement, eighty-five million they're going to pay out. It's about three hundred thousand per uh, Catholic who is abused. But they the the logic was they should settle now because pedophilia is going to be the window to get a big payout is is dwindling. It's over because pedophilia has a different meaning in America now. It's become politicized. People see pedophilia, they throw it around. There's no, they, they question the credibility of anyone who says pedophilia or mentions pedophile. So I you know it, it's just something that, it's, it's interesting that you bring it up because I, I think that's true. I, it's, it's amazing how, how did that happen, David? That, you know, in the course of our lifetimes, I mean, pedophilia is always bad, but how did it become the emotional, Tr trigger that politicos have used to set off a nation and set off society. That's and, and, and they've cheapened pedophilia. I'm not trying to make a joke out of it, but they've cheapened it. Oh, well, they, that's what I mean. Look, look, they use it in the child pornography thing, uh, you know, charge against Katanji Brown Jackson. It, it's become a, a, a an arrow in the quiver of the, you know, the political manipulators and you know, and this goes back to what Obama was saying. We have forgot, we have lost the ability to distinguish between what's true and what's not true. We have lost the ability to distinguish between propaganda and truth and, you know, what's, what's political and, and at least how to talk about our disagreements so that we, we know that we are, this is a, a, an analogy that Obama always likes to bring up, that we are on the same team. Right. We should be on the same team, but we act like we're not. Right. When you get rid of the nonsense, what divides us? What are we really divide? The hatred of Republicans because they're not part of our team, the hatred of Democrats because they're not part of our team. What divides the Democrats and the Republicans? Abortion? Yeah, well, now I think, you know, I think you LGBTQ go, rights go back to what the, the things that really have always divided America and it's race and class. I really think it's race and class and you see it sometimes go down, you know, being pushed down low in the list. But, you know, there's, you know, when people talk about immigration, that's a race issue. Also somewhat of a class issue. 
when you see people talk about, uh, you know, healthcare, that could be a race and class issue. I think race and class divides. And uh, I, 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 I think that's the importance of Obama just being a figurehead. See, I'm, I'm, I'm now acknowledging that Obama is just like, he's like the hood ornament. He's the hood ornament for people who believe that America could be the kind of place that, that we all hope. And, you know, we when, think you, when you say race and class, yeah, one would think that the Democratic Party would be the home to class resentment, but it's not. Yeah, it should it should be. One would hope, but yeah. Well, there's no the, class, the, there's no class resentment. Well, the Democrats, in the Democratic Party. The Democrats have moved over to the middle, right? I mean, so they're and and some of the corporates they'll give to the Republicans and the Democrats. They just want the power. They just want the people in charge, and so they they have created this great big you know middle pool that everyone jumps into. And then, and all the rest of us are on the fringe in terms of, of class. And so, but I think class and race is what's, what, what divides us. I mean, there's still a healthy sense of xenophobia, still a healthy sense of class snobbery. So what's happened is we divided, the Republicans took class and the Democrats took color. Most of the time. Most of that, and then and then the Republicans took Clarence Thomas, and then. But for uh, the most part, if you vote for the Republicans, you have class resentment towards the the educated, the elitists, and you're a racist. That's part of the Republican allure. If you're a Democrat, you don't think about class; you think about identity. That's what they've given us, the choice. That's the well, choice. I don't know. If, yeah, I think that's sort of how it's evolved. Um, I, I think evolved, it, or is this what the Clintons and the Obamas did to the party? Well. They took money from Wall Street. Wow. So, they, so they rid the party of class resentment, which was its backbone since the time of Roosevelt, right? FDR said, I'm a traitor to my class. And yeah, uh, well, it used to be about class resentment. Right. He wasn't so great to the Filipinos either, though, when he, uh, you know, uh, oh, actually, it was he said he it was FDR's promise to give Filipinos uh, citizenship if they fought alongside Americans. It was Truman who rescinded the promise. So. Hmm. He's only well, half of that here's, what, here's what we have to do. Yeah. Today, we're getting through the show. Uh, we're going to try to get with our dignity intact. So I'm going to thank you for coming on the show because we have to move on and there have been massive technical problems. We shut down the YouTube feed. I've shut down my audio so this i don't know how we're going to assemble this show but we're going to soldier on emil well, guillermo last thoughts and well, then th yeah my last thoughts I, you know i wanted to tell you we talked about sexism and racism i just wanted to put in a word for fighting ageism because i think that's the last thing that we that's the last hump that we need to get over because we're all going to get old and we're lucky if we're lucky, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've become more sensitive to it. I wrote a column in the Aldef uh, blog on ageism and Diane Feinstein. Forget her politics. I think it's just wrong that she gets smeared for being mentally, for being called mentally unfit because she forgot a few things. Um, it may be a pattern, but you know, let, let her doctor and and her family decide if she's fit for office. I just think that. When you ever see a political smear like that, there's something else going on. Someone wants her seat. Someone wants her out so they could be in the Senate. And I just think that's as disgusting as anything racist or sexist uh, that uh, can be out there in, in the public. You know, and considering she's the senator of six million Asian Americans, the largest Asian American, you know, population in, in America, it, it becomes an Asian American issue.
But anyway, I want. And what, uh, and what has she done for the Asian Americans? Well, I, I it's what she's been there for the community ever since she was a supervisor in San Francisco, since she was um, the mayor of San Francisco. And then ultimately when she uh, has been in the Senate since 92, I just think she as. Well, but what has she done for them specifically? Uh, I think if you went back over her career, you'd say that she was inclusive of Asian Americans in, in her, in uh, the legislation that she's passed. Uh, you know, I, I can't point to any one thing, but I know that she has been supported by the Asian American community throughout her career. So, but when you're, how old is she? 84? 88, I believe. 88? Do, do you think it's healthy for an 88 year old to be senator? I think that it's. You think that's, would you want that? Would you be, would you, when you turn 88, do you think that's a good idea for you to be a United States senator? Well, would you want your parents at 88? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, David. Kind of sick. Well, the way the Senate works, though, the, the, seniority is everything and seniority is power not personal power but it's seniority is power for the state it's power for uh you know her positions and you know we, we can disagree on like oh well what is a diane feinstein position i mean she's a fairly moderate democrat but the republicans don't use the seniority system anymore oh yes yeah, say charles grassley out of iowa he's but, good He's but they've, they've, they've shaken it up where the chairmanships are no longer based on how long you've served, right? Well, well I don't believe so. Tell that to Charles Grassley, you know, who's running again. Tell I mean, it, the, the, the precedent is there with Strom Thurmond. Uh, the thing about Feinstein is she's a woman. And I would think that she has served as served the public well enough that it should be up to her to decide if the time has come. And if it's not, then it's not up to some politicos and journos to leak something to the press under an as an anonymous source. These people came out as an anonymous. So read my column. They said because they did not want to upset their relationship with Feinstein. Get that. How's that? They, oh, we don't want to upset her to know to let her know that we're stabbing her in the back and the front. We just want people to know that she's mentally unfit. There's something wrong with that. People should, if they have a beef with her, they should confront her, talk to her. And then if she is of sound mind and body, she should be able to make a decision on her own. And she's a woman. She deserves that right. All right. Emil Guillermo is the host of the PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Read him over at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Dave. Sorry Thanks. about our tech difficulties. No problem. No, pro no problem. I am now going to turn the show over to the Reverend Barry W. Lynn, who has a special guest. And I apologize for keeping you waiting. We've had some technical problems tonight. Uh, we crashed the, the live stream, so we had to reboot it. So I'm going to now turn the show over to the Reverend Barry W. Lynn for nearly a quarter of a century. He ran Americans United for separation of church and state. He is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, as well as a lawyer. Welcome, Reverend. Uh, oh, hang on. Uh, I got to unmute you. All right. Oh, very now good. you're unmuted and you're Terrific. <laughs> Terrific. I'm very, very glad that we have our guest with us. D. Knight is his name. He's the author of a new a book, a memoir, and a kind of manifesto called My Whirlwind Lives. And he certainly has had those. I don't think I've had an extended conversation, Dee, with you since about 1978. But in reading the book, I found a couple things out about you I didn't even remember from your past. Welcome That's to the good. show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. 
<laughs> I wanted I, I wanted to thank Emo for defending the rights of old people since we qualify, even though we don't like to think about ourselves. <laughs> We don't like to think about it, but we do get reminded of it on a regular basis. Um, well, uh, Dee and I actually first met uh, in the middle 1970s when we were working for something called a universal unconditional amnesty. We worked together. We had some brutal arguments together during that course of trying to find a way to gain some kind of relief for those who directly resisted the war, as well as Vietnam veterans uh, who were stigmatized by what were then called other than honorable discharges. It was a long, long struggle. But the one, th one thing I learned very early in your book, D, was that you, I think in high school, actually in a mock election, voted for Barry Goldwater. And uh, right. at that was about the same time I was wearing a giant Barry Goldwater pin. And there was this young woman somewhere, uh, I believe in Arkansas, uh, who, whose name was Hillary Clinton, who also was championing Barry Goldwater. I remember vaguely why I thought Barry Goldwater made sense. I was totally unaware of the war in Vietnam. And, but I did think he stood for something. He had principles at a time when it appeared that Democrats running for office had no principles at all. What attracted you, even if briefly, to Barry Goldwater? Well, I think it was mainly geography. You know, just, I was uh, uh, back in Idaho where I was born uh, about a year and a half ago when my wife and I drove across the country to visit my mom as she threatened to turn 100 years old. Uh, and I had a conversation with my uh, cousin and his wife who uh, are still rock solid Republicans. And I asked them why. And they said, well, everybody around here is. And I think that was true in Eastern Oregon as well. Uh, it's also true that... Um, you know, uh, my uh, grandfather, who was a very bright guy, uh, never said the word Democrat without the word damn in front of it. So uh, it made it easy, but it didn't take long. All I had to do was be exposed to some people thinking critically and um, uh, take a close look at what was happening in the world at that time. Uh, with the surge of the civil rights movement, the um, uh, escalation of the war in Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera, to change my mind. I didn't go far at first. I mean, Lyndon Johnson was a peace candidate, you may recall. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, That's what he said. <laughs> um, the, I did not go to Chicago in 1968. Later, I met many of the people, including a number of the people that were arrested in 1968. You were there, but in the book you say you weren't so much a participant as a kind of uh, observer. When you, what did you observe in that summer of 1968 in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention that kind of gelled everything? Was it police brutality? Was it just the utter unwillingness of the Democratic Party to take peace candidates, real peace candidates, seriously? What was the trigger in 1968 when you sat there and watched what was going on while I was watching it on television? Where were you? You were there. Well, it was yes to both. I did get down to uh, the park with the demonstrators. I was there as an organizer for Eugene McCarthy, who I still thought at the time uh, was uh, pushing hard to stop the war and to get the nomination. I felt that he had essentially inherited Bobby Kennedy's mantle. But, you know, uh, going down into the streets as well as uh, participating with uh, McCarthy people, it became clear that the system was designed to lock us out and the police were there mm -hmm. to guarantee that that happened. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the lesson graphically was if you uh, stand up to oppose the war 
in the streets, you're going to get your head bashed in. Mm -hmm. That was an important lesson for me at the time. It did not change my desire to stand up and oppose wars, but uh, sure. it, it uh, changed my understanding of the system. When the war finally comes to a conclusion, um, I was already a part of this amnesty movement. I had moved to Washington and worked for the United Church of Christ. And I remember when Saigon fell, as the news put it, I was elated. I was so glad that happened. And I assume you were too. Yes, the first thing I did was buy a bottle of champagne, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I brought it back to the uh, uh, War Resisters uh, office where the National Council for Universal Unconditional Amnesty had its offices. I, <clears throat> not everybody wanted to share the champagne, but it was a time for celebration as far as I was concerned. Yes, yeah. very much so. And then it looked like maybe the war being over there was a possibility that people would come to their senses and realize, even if they wouldn't admit it out loud, that the resistors to the war were right. Not that everyone who fought the war was wrong, but that the architects of the war were wrong. They were the people who had made all of the terrible decisions. But when you, when you go back to some of those events, I, I want to just mention a couple of them. When Gerald Ford, when Nixon resigned and Gerald Ford became president, uh, he, was, um, he was president at the time that one of the leaders of the more or less universal amnesty movement, the late Senator Phil Hart. Phil Hart and his wife Jane Hart were leading advocates for the end of the war in Vietnam. When Gerald Ford found out that Phil Hart had died, I had been with him a couple of weeks before, and Ford says to Mrs. Hart, what can I do for you? And she says, you could grant an amnesty for those who resisted the war. And Ford said, uh, let me think about it. And I got a call. I don't remember if it was from Mrs. Hart or from uh, one of the other activists who said, come back to Washington. I was visiting my parents. They want everybody's going to come and have a big press conference. And it was a hugely well attended press conference with Mrs. Hart and a couple of us. And I don't remember if you were there that day or not, but the cameras, I had never seen so many television cameras on the nightly news. There was not one minute, not one split second of coverage of that, which started to remind me, maybe the mass media really isn't on the side of the good either. Do you remember that incident? Well, I remember uh, uh, the Hart amnesty. Uh, I was uh, uh, still basically in Canada. I was physically in Canada at the time. I had... Um, won my own legal case and was free to travel. And by then, uh, I believe by then, I was already uh, 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 um, the exile representative to the National Council for Universal Unconditional Amnesty. We um, had done quite a lot of study and analysis. And even though uh, we recognized the uh, uh, what you could call the good heart of the heart uh, uh, amnesty proposal, it still wasn't enough for us at the time. And we were not there, although we'd recognized that it was what you could call a sea change in, right. uh, in support for amnesty, a sea change going our way. There had been other hearings, you know, uh, uh, Ed Koch, um, and several other uh, uh, Congress people, including uh, Ed, Edward Kennedy, uh, had uh, called for amnesty. All of them were essentially conditional amnesty, the same kind of thing that ultimately uh, <clears throat> uh, Ford granted, calling it clemency, a conditional clemency for a small fraction of war resistors, essentially the white middle class draft resistors as long as we would uh, do some alternate service. Exactly. And of course, 
we um, we rejected that and called a boycott. I'm happy to say I think a couple of uh, uh, my co-leaders of the Amnesty Collective, both Jerry Condon and um, Steve Grossman, are probably with us tonight. I'm not positive, but I think so. Uh, they were uh, part of our uh, squadron of uh, courageous activists who used that uh, offer of clemency to uh, challenge it by coming back from exile subject to arrest to defy it. Both of them did uh, very courageous trips. Uh, Steve spoke at a big amnesty conference in Louisville uh, at the time. Uh, uh, and uh, he and his partner Evangeline uh, toured the Midwest extensively for several weeks before returning to Toronto. Jerry, uh, who already had been uh, convicted in absentia of desertion uh, after uh, uh, going AWOL from the uh, Green Berets. Uh, he came back uh, underground uh, in February of 75. I coordinated his, his uh, traveling and helped him get to DC where he surfaced at a conference hosted by uh, Ramsey Clark and Gold Star Mother Louise Ransom, where you probably were there. I imagine you were. I he think so. As, he surfaced as a special guest at that conference, made a splash in the media, uh, uh, received a lot of support, and he and his partner Sandy got on an airplane and flew to LA and continued a tour that never really stopped. That's one thing about Jerry. He, <laughs> That's right. He, He's still he, at it. He's still at it and he's doing a great job. He's been a leader of the Veterans for Peace now for longer than I can remember. I mean, uh, we're talking about from uh, the mid 1970s right up to the present day. By my Indeed. math, that's a, little, that's a little more than four decades. <laughs> yeah, uh, Gerald Ford, for people who don't know what a conditional amnesty was, said, well, you can, be, you can get your record expunged, but you have to do some kind of civilian service. Uh, and in many cases, it was actually giving civilian service obligations to people who weren't in fact in any legal jeopardy. So it was a terrible idea. When you and many others said, boycott this, they did. And the thing was a total flop. Now, Jimmy Carter comes in and by polling data, not because of his, uh, I'm sure he is a vaunted uh, Christian believer, but at the time, he was told by pollsters, if you don't do more than Gerald Ford did about this, these war resistors, you can't even get the Democratic nomination. So he does get the Democratic nomination. There's a very big highlight of an event at the Democratic National Convention where he, uh, where a man named Fritz Efaw, who had been in exile in England, had come back to the United States. He was nominated by the aforementioned uh, Louise Ransom, who was at the time the head of uh, Gold Star Parents for Amnesty, as well as the wonderful Ron Kovic. Many people know Kovic, sadly, only because of the movie Born on the Fourth of July with Tom Cruise playing Ron. But it was an extraordinarily powerful event. So then it comes down to trying to convince the Carter people, what are you going to do? And how broad is this going to be? And how unconditional is it going to be? So the first couple of days after he was nominated, uh, he, he grants a kind of a pardon, he called it, for certain selective service violators. And then a week or two later does something for so-called deserters so that they could get back into the United States, but did absolutely nothing for the hundreds of thousands of veterans who had been discharged with other than honorable discharges. And for people who don't know anything about that system, these are so-called administrative discharges. They're not something you get after a courts martial. Somebody, your commanding officer sends somebody to talk to you and says, well, um, I don't think you like to be here, son, and uh, you're smoking a lot of dope, and, but we can get you out. Now, you'll have this thing called an undesirable discharge, but, you know, you won't go to jail. They never told 
people how bad a stigma this would be and how unemployable it would make most of the people who had obtained those other than honorable discharges. When you look back over the whole scope of things, was there any benefit to what we did in the amnesty movement, benefit by means of a lesson learned for the future? Did the future learn anything from watching what came and went during that time? Well, it's a really good question, Barry. Uh, and I think the answer is a qualified yes. First of all, our, our, uh, our inside slogan, the slogan we had for ourselves was amnesty for the future, not just the past. We were basically fighting for the right to resist or refuse to serve in unjust wars. And uh, we were especially fighting for that for active duty soldiers, GIs. And um, you mentioned uh, the uh, veterans with other than honorable discharges. Uh, the vast majority of this half million people during the Vietnam period uh, were uh, GIs who basically were insubordinate one way or the other. Some of them just uh, saying, hell no. Some of them, you know, being insubordinate in all kinds of ways. Uh, and the discharge was something that the uh, military had to do for its own sake. They had to get rid of troublemakers in their ranks who were so great that by 1970, uh, one Marine colonel wrote a famous essay in which he said that the army was breaking down. All kinds of things were happening. Now, you're right. I, I would say among us, once again, it was Jerry Condon, you know, who uh, lived out our commitment to uh, fighting for the rights of veterans and active duty GIs, no matter what, for how, as long as it takes. And I can say that um, uh, especially Jerry, but others of us have worked not only with Veterans for Peace, but with the About Face group, which is essentially Iraq veterans against the war. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, both uh, Vietnam era war resistors and veterans, as well as uh, uh, George Bush Sr. and Jr. did was instill a desire to refuse on the part of the active duty GIs of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. So there was a lot of it. Um, it's different. It's less visible than it was during our time, uh, both because there's no draft, so we don't see the kind of massive uh, student resistance to the draft. And the poverty draft works very well. Uh, young people go in by the thousands to the military because it's an opportunity for them and they only find out later what they're looking at and often right. it's uh only in the process of trying to get out or actually getting out that they realize what has hit them um, but it's a process it's a little bit more gradual and evolutionary but we see and i mean this we see a generation of people who are far and far much less uh, willing to say, okay, Uncle Sam, I'm with you. They go in for opportunistic reasons. Sure. Uh, they hope like, uh, they hope that they uh, won't get sent to combat. They get sent to combat. They come with, with uh, uh, traumatic brain, brain injury and many, many other problems that stay with them a long time. And so it's a, it's a long-term fight. Yeah, I think it has made it extremely difficult to think about returning to an actual draft. And um, I don't want to belabor it, but you talked about McCarthy. And I, of course, was fond of McCarthy. Bobby Kennedy was also running, I think, in some ways, particularly after this impassioned speech Bobby Kennedy gave in Indianapolis after the assassination of Dr. King. I became much more of a supporter of Kennedy until his own tragic assassination. Gene McCarthy wanted to be president in 1968. He didn't get there. He stayed in the Senate for a very long time. 
And um, then he decided, probably in the early 70s, that he was going to re- call for a return to something called universal service, not necessarily in the military, but some kind of forced service on the part of every young person in the country. And I even remember having a debate with him at Yale, at the Yale Political Union on this very topic. And you and I and he, everybody understood and understands the poverty draft, but he seemed to think He seemed to take it deeper, like by dint of being born in the United States, you owe your government something. And I uh, I had an enormous problem with that. And I still do. The idea that because you happen to be born in the United States, you somehow are allowed or you're, you're forced to allow the government to tell you how you can best serve your country. And the people I see in Washington who live in Southeast Washington, or people in South Central Los Angeles, I don't think that those young people, frankly, owe one damn thing to the government that doesn't give them a decent education, hasn't given their parent or their parents a decent job, and just has treated them as if they didn't exist. To me, you've got to earn something if you're the government you don't get owed it by dint of being an american citizen it's kind of the opposite of john kennedy's statement ask not what the, you can do for <laughs> ask not what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country i say with all due respect to john kennedy who said a lot of good things that's a piece of junk <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, I think what's needed is a real commitment to full employment and free education and or training for young people. That could include something like the Civilian Conservation Corps that FDR had, maybe this time providing jobs, converting to green energy and so on. Um, You know, but meanwhile, obviously, the country needs to be cured of its addiction to militarism, not increase it. You know, and I, I, I think that it's, to use a fancy word, it's all too facile to talk <laughs> about natu- national service. You know, how about um, uh, providing opportunities? FDR also uh, called for and committed to full employment. That went out the window. But, you sure. know, it's clear that uh, young people want opportunities Uh, not only to serve, but to do good things in the community. And a program that focused on that would, I think, be very, very popular and valuable. Um, And I I think that the key is to separate it from militarism. It's very, very difficult in this country to think of anything that is not separated from militarism because militarism seems to dominate everything. That's, in my opinion, what has to stop. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, look, if you have more opportunities for people to have a decent wage paying job when they get out of high school, if they don't want to go to college or they're not feeling that's where they ever want to go, to be able to get a job from the government voluntarily, I'm all for that. But this idea of forcing it is where I you know, had to draw the line with Gene McCarthy. And uh, I, I think that the vote at that Yale Political Union thing was something like 95% in my favor, 5% in his. And he looked out at this huge crowd of Yale law students and said, uh, well, I am at Yale. So, <laughs> well, I'd I vote for you for president over Gene McCarthy today. <laughs> well, that's, I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm not going to be running. Um, <laughs> Let me talk about electoral politics, though, just for a minute, because you you talk a lot in the book about the Green New Deal, about AOC and the commitment that she she seems to have. Um, A couple of weeks ago on this program, I was talking about uh, the Democratic Socialists of America, and I know you've been active in them. I don't know if you still are. But during the effort to reestablish registration for men in the draft. Michael Harrington, who was the founder of Democratic Socialists of America, and I, uh, Harrington was also the author of a spectacularly well-informed book called The Other America. And we used to share a lot of platforms, but both of us were criticized somewhat by some of the people for 
actually saying, because this was the time that Jimmy Carter was using the Russian invasion of Afghanistan as a justification. We have to be prepared. You know, we have to prove that our young men can be sent over if we have to. Uh, we were criticized for criticizing Russia for going for the Soviet Union at that time for going into Afghanistan. Um, then a few weeks ago in reading some of this articles about what the Democratic Socialists of America were doing about the war in Ukraine, they had officially announced that they were in favor of pulling out of NATO, pulling out of NATO. And the writers for several of these articles had actually gone even to AOC and said, well, what do you think about this? The Democratic Socialists of America have had a big influence in your election. And she wouldn't even talk about it I have no independent basis to know that, but it seems to me that that's a really good question to ask NATO. What does it mean in the year 2022? I'm, I'm upset if it's true that she wouldn't even answer the question. Well, get out of NATO and no NATO are very, very timely slogans today. NATO should have been abolished long ago. Uh, at least at the same time as the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. About AOC, I wrote in my book that I admire her fearlessness, but she isn't perfect. She has made significant mistakes, especially on foreign policy issues. I think that if we look at Congress, uh, we can see that it's a poisonous cesspool of racist, imperialist power mongering. Anyone breathing the air there can be infected by it. And that's true uh, even of AOC. Uh, I do continue to appreciate her contributions to the popular struggle for justice. And I hope she accepts the advice she has received to study uh, foreign policy issues better and understand that uh, US wars abroad have all I said all been imperialist unjust wars uh, since before she was born, uh, uh, since I was born and I'm older. Uh, you know, I, and I think that we've seen this. It's, uh, uh, I do continue uh, active involvement in DSA as a member of the International Committee. And I'm glad to say that uh, the International Committee has focused on NATO as the cause of the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, uh, I, uh, AOC probably is, it finds it too hot to handle. Bernie Sanders doesn't have a very good position on it either. You know, they are really um, caught in the avalanche of uh, unanimity behind uh, Biden and the neocons on this issue. Uh, but uh, it's it's a struggle. I mean, just just putting it in context, uh, AOC even had a difficulty um, uh, holding the line on Venezuela when uh, when uh, Trump was yep. dumping on Venezuela. A little bit less bad than on uh, uh, on Venezuela than this time, but still much to be desired. It's a very tough sledding thing. And it's our responsibility as uh, hardcore anti-imperialists, I think, to, um, uh, to conduct uh, nonstop uh, education, both of those few representatives close to us, as well as the general public. Let me ask you something about these, the revolutionary movements that I think most people on the left really had a, a tremendous sense that this was this was the avenue. When Batista left Cuba, Fidel Castro comes in and he revolutionizes many, many aspects of the Cuban culture, including its, its health care system, which had been miserable and elitist and then was much more open to many, many people. But the most, you know, I for a couple of years, I did a, a a radio show on NBC with Pat Buchanan of all people. And Pat, it was, yeah, it was kind of a left-right thing. And once 
I was moaning about something that Fidel Castro had done in response to the LGBT community in Cuba. And I said, you know, in a sense, Pat, he betrayed the revolution. And I thought Buchanan was literally going to fall off his chair. He said, you think that's important? I said, yeah, I think that's central to a revolution. What do you think? Did you feel any sense of betrayal by anything that Fidel Castro or his brother did at the, over the course of their leadership in Cuba? As just an example of revolutionary movements that started out pure and then faltered, at least in my opinion. Well, I think every revolution is a work in progress that's undertaken by fearless and imperfect humans. Uh, I wrote in my book that in the early days of Cuba's revolution, the old traditional patriarchal patterns remained more or less intact, even among the leadership. But over the years, uh, the Cuban leadership, especially Raul and his daughter Mariela, uh, came to understand that gay liberation was part of the revolution. And in recent years, educational campaigns on LGBTQ issues have been implemented under the leadership of Mariela Castro. Um, and it's really helped the LGBTQ movement in the US and worldwide uh, to start to realize that socialism and liberal, liberal, liberation really do go together. Just looking at ourselves at the uh, progressive and revolutionary movement in this country, it's worth remembering that we knew almost nothing in 1959 and 60. You know, it took us quite a long time to wake up too. And I think that we really need to uh, recognize and thank uh, the gay liberation movement, the lesbian and gay movement, and uh, everything that has followed in its wake for uh, uh, spirited and continuous effort to uh, uh, win a place in the struggle for liberation. It's a process. Yeah, that certainly is. I mean, even in the late 1960s, you know, if a woman would show up at a progressive meeting, um, there would be people in the so-called leadership who would say, can you operate a mimeograph machine? Now, most people don't even know what a mimeograph machine is. But when I was a high school teacher, I lived by mimeograph machines. I was given a lecture to a college class about a year ago, and I mentioned mimeograph machines. And I was, it was Zoom, so I could see almost everybody. And everybody like, what? <laughs> but yes, it, it is a process. It really, really is a process. And, and even... You know, I spoke to the Secular Students uh, of, of America convention a few years ago, and I deliberately started talking to them and saying, you know, it was a Saturday night. I said, it's a Saturday night here. I can tell you in 1969, when I was in college, we wouldn't have been caught dead listening to some white guy give a speech about anything, much less separation of church and state. And I said, but this is what we do. And then I would gradually, I'd say, you know, first thing we'd do, we'd, we'd go, we'd get some bottles of wine, Matus wine, you know, because you could turn it into a, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> candle wax would drip down and you could put it in your dorm room, you know, or your apartment. Yes. And, uh, and I said, wow. but then, but then, you know, we'd say, well, let's, Let's go down and uh, see uh, see somebody at the African American Cultural Committee because that's the only time we'd see a black person except in our sociology class. And as things got worse and worse, and I said, and then we put on a Joan Baez record. You know, she was a woman who said the only good. She said, uh, uh, "Girls say yes to boys who say no." And Eldridge Cleaver, who famously said the only place for a woman in the movement is prone. And by that point, the, the audience, I mean, they were so upset. They could, and then I said, I'm glad you're upset. We weren't that upset when we'd hear that stuff or do those things. You're already way ahead of us. So we do need to make those changes. And I agree with you. One of the things when you look at the environment, the environment, I care about it. I don't know as much as many, many other people do about it. But here's something I worry about. Um, I got interested in the environmental movement 
first with a colleague at the United Church of Christ who uh, was an active African-American pastor, and he was talking about environmental racism, the fact that so many of the toxic waste sites in the United States happen to be located in communities that predominantly contain black or brown persons. And that, that was something. Now you look at what the people care about and all of the polling that's done, the environment is kind of way, way down the list. They're worried about inflation. They're worried about immigration. They're worried about this, that, and the next thing. Let's say you got something like the Green New Deal passed. Then you have to, though, be prepared for it to be challenged in the courts. And I spent a huge amount of my life worrying about and being a part of the judicial system in this country. It is corrupt now. It has been corrupted, not just by the huge number of people that Donald Trump put on the bench, but I think we saw it perhaps most vividly just a few days ago when this perfectly sensible effort to have people mask on airplanes and other forms of public transportation is declared unconstitutional by a single woman judge, 33 years old when she was nominated to serve in a district court in Florida. She hears the case. She said, yep, it's um, unconstitutional. It just, you, you can't do that. Reads a statute in a way that I think most law professors probably, you know, pull, pull their hair out. Um, she's going to be there for a long time. Statistically, she's going to live till she's 80 and be making these same decisions. If the good bills are passed and you have them considered by a corrupted judicial system at every level, not just the Supreme Court, but all the way down to the federal district courts, where, where do you get what you call in the book revolutionary optimism? Where do you get it? Because I, I think I know what you're talking about. And I give a lot of lectures about the Supreme Court where I say, have you, have you given up on the court? Well, that's national suicide. But there are days when I think even I have given up on the courts. Very understandable. Uh, there's really two questions there. I got first on the issue of uh, how to actually win a Green New Deal. We got to understand it's going to take much more than legislation and government action to save sure. the planet, especially from environmental racism. Toxic waste sites and industrial pollution, like in Detroit, make it clear that corporations continue to have much more power than people. And they can get the government to let them off the hook. They can buy judges. They can do a whole lot of things. My own view is that it's only a mass popular movement that can win the change we need, especially now, especially now with the court that we have. And that, it, like you say, it looks like we're going to have for quite a while. Their timeline is different from our timeline. Uh, in my book, I said my revolutionary optimism, uh, considering myself, is, is in considering myself part of a widening and deepening stream of expanded consciousness about new and better possibilities. The amazing success of our struggle for amnesty, together with the defeat of Nixon way back when uh, who, he was forced to resign in 74, they served as an example to me of what we can do, that change is possible that solidarity and perseverance can lead to encouraging breakthroughs. And I continue to believe that we can uh, make solidarity and struggle work for us, that it's really the force of life itself and it will prevail. You know, uh, I find myself most inspired these days uh, by uh, the Amazon workers fighting for a union. Absolutely. Right now I'm wearing a... Uh, Starbucks apron. I bought one used and I, I'm just looking to get a badge so it'll say Starbucks Union. But uh, these movements and Black Lives Matter, along with uh, what Bernie and AOC have done, uh, they're what really give me hope. And um, 
you know, I think that it's very, very important not to base our hope on counting votes, mm -hmm. especially not in Congress and also not in the Supreme Court. And as, as much as I do think it's absolutely necessary for us to continue fighting for the right to vote and fighting to vote, we know that the system is rigged against uh, ordinary people. And it's really uh, a much more basic form of struggle that's going to win what we want. But we need to see that even in these very, very difficult times, uh, popular victories continue to be uh, won. And obviously, many times they're also taken away. Minneapolis is a very interesting case in point. You know so. where uh, uh, George Floyd was killed uh, by a cop. The cop is now uh, convicted. Um, the people, um, you know, won uh, a law to defund the police. That's been reversed, and they continue. You know, um, uh, speaking of book promotion, uh, I noticed uh, just this week that uh, my old friend Clarence Thomas, the longtime leader of Local 10, uh, mm -hmm. the longshore workers uh, out in San Francisco, is doing a tour. He'll be speaking at a, uh, uh, at a Teamster Hall uh, uh, here in Long Island, uh, uh, I think next week, promoting his book, uh, you know, which is uh, about the Million Worker March. You know, and, and uh, he gives me inf in inspiration along with Chris Smalls and some personal friends I have that were in the Amazon Labor Union. And what they show is that no matter what goes on at the top, there are things going on at the base level of society that are definitely reasons for hope mm -hmm. and optimism. You know, um, I have spent a lot of time uh, when I was at the ACLU and later at Americans United for Separation of Church and State, working with musicians, because I remember how important the culture was when I was growing up, when I was in high school, and the first time I heard Phil Oaks, uh, who unfortunately I never had a chance to meet, uh, I've met his sister, but... Um, because he said, you know, I, I ain't marching anymore. You know, he has a song, Draft Dodge Rag, about all of the, uh, all of the uh, reasons why he wouldn't be. And then of uh, when my wife and I were in college and we, we got married just a week after we both graduated from college. And we, um, we were fascinated by music in Boston. We were both in graduate school at Boston, scholarships and all that stuff. But um, was Bruce Phillips, Utah Phillips, who was a socialist organizer and a marvelous person. And I remember one weekend we went to three different colleges to hear him speak and to sing his songs because he never sings a song without talking about the context of it and the labor songs in particular. I learned more in those three concerts than I did in all of college about the labor movement. Labor history is not taught anywhere in high schools. And now we can barely speak about African-American slavery because that's considered like it's too, it's too provocative. It's like teaching <laughs> kids how to have sex when they're six. <laughs> so what do you, so how do you do, what do you, if you, if you lose your labor history, then the chances of these burgeoning, we had one of the organizers on this, on this show, David had a, one of the organizers of the Amazon strike on months ago. But aside from that, where do you start to remind people, not just of the past of labor, but how much labor means and needs to achieve in the near future? How do you do that? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I think that it really does have to come up from below. You know, the big news uh, in the Amazon uh, labor union movement has come from uh, workers in these giant warehouses uh, organizing. They're making 
the news because they're doing something that uh, the organized union movement has not been able to do, at least not up to now. Just like in the fight, the fight for 15, you know, the, the battles of the fast food workers, mm-hmm. uh, it took, you know, constant struggle at, you know, all these small uh, restaurant outlets, you know, McDonald's and, and Burger King and all the rest for even one union, the SEIU, to take them seriously and start to say, yes, we support you. It's coming from below. But of course, um, there are, you know, uh, especially among the unionists of color, efforts uh, to spread it out coming from at least the middle and sometimes the top. The news media is not going to cover it unless it's shaking things up. And so I guess what we have to do is uh, shake things up. You know, it's a good idea. (laughs) Let me see if uh, Mr. Feldman here, David, do you have any questions uh, that you'd perhaps like to ask as we uh, end this hour? I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yes. Well, you keep going. That is my question. This is fascinating. (laughs) Please continue. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, I I think the, um, the culture is important. And I think that, and then there are certainly people out there singing about revolution, singing about the labor movement, singing about women's struggles that are very, very important. And, um, but it does seem that the culture has lost the edge that it had in the 60s and early 70s, and that that's depriving, in a sense, it sounds a little paternalistic, depriving young people today of an opportunity to learn through films and television and music what we need to do next to make this a better world. Well, it's an interesting observation. I don't think it's completely true. It's just that it's very, very different from uh, what it was in our generation. Remember that um, in the early and mid 60s, um, the uh, civil rights movement had been going for a decade and um, had generated uh, virtually a generation of people, singers, And uh, of course, uh, I uh, woke up with Bob Dylan uh, and uh, uh, Joan Baez and numerous others. It was, and of course, because it was a youth movement among uh, uh, college kids who were waking up, this kind of cultural awakening was very, very dramatic and very highly visible. I think the, the spoken word movement and rap music, mm. rap has been around now for about four decades at least. Yeah. You know, uh, of course, it surged up through um, African-American young people uh, coming from the streets. It is still very, very visible. You know, it's not my music, I confess. You know, it, uh, even though my son... Uh, loves it and uh, tried to teach me about Nas, for example, who I noticed recently has, you know, achieved uh, kind of a uh, royalty status. Um, It's it's, uh, uh, what you could call uh, the demographics of the movement of young people has changed in a way that makes it less obviously visible to uh, a white dominant society, especially now that the media has sort of gone along with uh, suppressing almost anything that's not mainstream, but it's there. Um, I'm not as aware of it as I would like to be, but it's definitely there. You know, I just want to circle right back to where we started because I think there's a sense uh, Some people say, well, you know, I would like to be interested in this issue or that issue. But, you know, my my parents, they couldn't care less. All it does is it causes me to get into arguments. Um, I remember very vividly 
the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which began the open-ended invitation for Lyndon Johnson to use any force necessary to start it. And I used to go to Ocean City, New Jersey with my parents every summer. My father, uh, he was an ununionized worker at the Bethlehem Steel, and he got, um, I think, two weeks. One week we'd go to the mountains, and then one week we'd go to the seashore. We always went to the same hotel. And here on a television this August night is this debate about what happened at the Gulf of Tonkin which of course was heavily promoted for decades as an attack on United States vessels by North Vietnamese ships. And of course that turned out to be a complete lie. Even Robert McNamara, the defense secretary during most of that time had to admit toward the end of his life, it never really happened. But my, my parents were Republicans. Uh, they were, they didn't think much about the war. They just wanted to make sure that if called, I would go. And I remember my father saying that August night, I said, you know, it's this war thing. And he said, don't worry, it'll be over very soon. And it wasn't. My dad had grown up in the Depression. He swept the floors in a candy factory in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And then when he wasn't doing that, he was a uh, playing the piano in silent movie houses, which is actually the last skill he lost when he, he had severe dementia at the end of his life. And the last thing that went was his ability to remember how do you play the Charlie Chaplin soundtracks. But, but your parents too, they were, they were good, hardworking people. Tell me, just for the, I know that there's some younger people who do listen regularly to this show. If your parents aren't particularly engaged with what you're doing, how do you start to talk to them about what matters most to you and why you want to continue to fight for a just world? How do you start that conversation? Well, I think carefully and respectfully is a good way, uh, but you also need to make it clear that you're going to do what you feel you have to do. Uh, if you can say that in a way that uh, uh, can be heard, uh, it's good. Um, it's sometimes necessary to put some distance between yes. oneself and home. You know, uh, I can still remember for better or worse that uh, I called my parents from Madison, Wisconsin mm. after I landed having dropped out of uh, San Francisco State College and sold my books in order to try and stop the war. Uh, and the same was true uh, when I uh, uh, went to Canada. I called home when I was there you know, and let them know. And then I wrote a lot of letters. I, <laughs> my mother uh, fairly recently in the last 10 years gave me my letters back. It was quite a volume of letters that I wow. sent to them trying to explain myself, you know, and they listened. I can, I can say that I had kind of a, a pleasant epiphany moment with my father when uh, I came home as part of the McCarthy campaign uh, in, uh, I guess it was in June of 68. And he actually said, uh, you know, I, I'm beginning to see some of what you're saying, I, you know, and that was really quite sure. nice. He, he did uh, acknowledge that he says, I don't think that I'll, you know, I'm not going to vote for this guy. I'll probably still vote for Nixon. I kind of looked at him quizzically, but that's <laughs> the way it is, you know, old ideas of and course. do die hard, you know. No. But I think that sticking to your principles and uh, standing up for yourself are things that young people need to do. Um, you know, Bob Dylan said uh, uh the old road is rapidly fading. Get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand. And the times are changing and they continue to change. Um, as progressive parents, I think it's 
uh, our responsibility to um, give our kids uh, as much support as we can, but also recognize that they're going to make decisions that we don't like also. Absolutely. Hey, D, it is a real pleasure to talk with you after all these years. And the book again, in My Whirlwind Lives, um, where, where can people, who's publishing it? Where is it available in local bookstores? Because we'd like to support local bookstores. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, it's published by Guernica Editions, which is a uh, Toronto, uh, that is to say, a Canada-based publisher. Um, it will be out in, in bookstores everywhere in June. Right now, it's available from 1804 Books, uh, which is part of the People's Forum in New York, so that uh, anyone can uh, Google 1804 Books and uh, look for My Whirlwind Lives, and it'll be right there. It's also available at uh, half a dozen bookstores in New York and two in Portland, where my mother lives. Um, and I hope that it will, you know, anybody who wants to suggest a bookstore that uh, could get an advanced, uh, uh, advanced copy, I'll be glad to do it. Um, Terrific. It's uh, available in May 1st books in or May Day bookstore in Minneapolis, and it'll be available in more and more bookstores across the country. Terrific. Dee, thank you so much. And uh, it's a wonderful read. And uh, there's a lot, a lot of stuff we didn't get a chance to do. But Dee Knight, it's called My Whirlwind Lives. David, I turn the show back to you. It's your thank show. You. Thank you very much. You're on mute, David. Yes, you're on okay. mute. Oh, okay. thank you, yep. Barry W. Lynn and D. Please come back. That was fascinating. Really, thank you. Great. Thank you. It's Terrific. great to just sit back and listen sometimes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Stay out of All trouble. Right. Only uh, good trouble, as you know. Okay. Thank you, D. Thank please you. Come back. You're listening to the David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. We had some technical issues. So if you're watching us on YouTube right now, this is part two. There, there are two parts to tonight's live stream. And let's now go to Joe in Norway for the falafel cam. And then it's time for the professors and Marianne. Hello, Joe in Norway. What are you preparing for us tonight? Good evening, David. Yep, I'll, I'll be making falafel. I heard um, Vladimir Putin give a shout out to uh, Israel's longest occupation on the planet, and I thought I might make some protest falafel. I'm not going to be making the Ashkenazim uh, flavored ones, the white pepper and salt. I'll be making a more Palestinian one with a bunch of uh, cilantro, and I use a mixture of these are soaked chickpeas and fava bean. So if you have a get anaphylactic shock from the fava, just substitute that with a, a redal or a, a lentil, all lentil. But the, um, the fava beans make it to bind together a lot better. So we, we soak the beans overnight, drain them, grind them with a bunch of spices like cumin, chili, uh, sesame seeds, we have turmeric and ground cumin, and then I'll fry up a little eggplant with the falafel as well. It's a nice and creamy eggplant. We have a, a member of our community who enjoys my uh, always cooking eggplant, and if I have enough time, I'll be making some, some horchata, which is a traditional Spanish drink made from tiger nuts just got these in town. Very special treat. Tiger nuts. Tiger nuts. Ow. What, what are tiger nuts? It's a rhizome. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It's a, a, just a rhizome that you soak in water and grind, and you can make a, a milk out of it. It's the original horchata. So in, in Mexico, they use rice and in Spain, they use tiger nuts. Why do they call them tiger nuts? 
Well, the the Spanish word is are they dangerous to pick? Is that why they're <laughs> and the Spanish word is chufas? Okay, tiger nuts. Well, we'll turn the sound down and watch you. I did some defensive eating because you give me a low blood sugar attack watching this. Joining us, it's time for the professors and Marianne. Joining us is Professor Marianne Cummings, a particle physicist, painter, political activist, and parks commissioner in Aurora, Illinois. Professor Ann Lee, who writes over at Daily Co's over at Daily Co's under the handle Annie Lee, Professor Jonathan Bick, who will be joining us for office hours to teach us about the Twilight Zone and Star Trek, and Professor Adnan Hussein, who teaches religion at Queen's University up in Kingston, Ontario. And it turns out that Elon Musk, this is interesting about Professor Adnan Hussein, Elon Musk, avoided military service in South Africa by attending Queen's University. You have to unmute yourself, Professor. Well, it is really loud here. I don't know if you can hear me. I have difficulty hearing you, but we just finished a reading sponsored, I think, by the University of Toronto political science graduate students of Ben Burgess's uh, Christopher Hitchens book. Wow. He read a chapter about his Trotskyism and uh, did a survey of kind of a resume in like 10 pages of left history, which was quite amazing, and then situated uh, Christopher Hitchens' kinds of uh, political ideas and his commitment to socialism and how it sort of faded. Um, talked a little bit about his... Uh, you know, pro-Iraq war stance, and um, Ben entertained a lively set of questions about Christopher Hitchens and his political transformation, how and why that happened, and he made just a lot of really interesting observations about that era of the 90s and 2000s, the turn to neoliberalism, the, you know, kind of how he fit in with the other sort of neocons in promoting uh, U.S. Uh, war, and uh, he was brilliant, and he's signing books and, um, you know, having his adoring fans uh, come and, uh, you know, pay their respects, so it was really quite a nice evening. I haven't had an evening kind of like this of some kind of cultural, intellectual event in so long that even if it hadn't been interesting, I would have been thrilled <laughs> just to have a little conversation uh, with people who are not my students. Wow. And, well, or, or on, or on, you know, or via Zoom, I guess, but actual right. live conversation. So Professor Ben Burgess is in Toronto tonight. He is in Toronto. I happen to be coming to Toronto for re a little research trip at the University of Toronto. And I saw that it was overlapping with his itinerary he posted on Facebook. And I thought, oh, I got to go out and uh, check it out. And uh, it's definitely well worth it. And um, really, you know, he's a brilliant guy. And um, it's a worthwhile, you know, book, I think, uh, to read. I have a lot of you know, problems with Christopher Hitchens. I met him once right after 9-11. We had invited him to talk about the situation. It was like October or November 2001. And he kind of came out, like, you know, in favor of, invading Afghanistan. I was sort of shocked. I was like, you invited this guy and he's, you know, really being very demeaning about, you know, the, you know, Islam and the Taliban and yes, we must crush them. And I thought, God, what happened to this guy? And uh, that was just a little preview of the larger pro-war stance he took much more publicly and aggressively in favor of Iraq. But, you know, Ben makes a good case that there's still a lot of his, um, you know, whole corpus of writing that is worth um, studying and preserving. I made the point that I thought in some ways um, he never was the kind of socialist that talked about, like he wouldn't have been down there with Christian Smalls talking about how wonderful this kind of workers coming together was. He was really more in the politics and culture. Perhaps that's an easier transition to make if you're not 
as rooted and grounded in the socioeconomic dimensions of socialism. Um, but so anyway, it was fun. It was interesting. Great. It was interesting. Uh, we have our esteemed colleagues here. Anybody want to talk to any questions? Well, I wonder if we if can you. he's if we can chat with him at some point. Uh, he's he's busy, but that would be so fun. That would be just fun. briefly, what did uh, change Christopher Hitchens to take that rightward turn in the early well, 2000s? I mean, I think the full explanation, you have to probably read the different steps and stages. You know, we have to probably read the book. But what I got from Ben tonight was that um, it was a long time coming. It wasn't just a kind of, uh, it wasn't grifting. He doesn't think that's a useful explanation, you know, that he just, you know, saw the green and turned to the dark side to feather his own nest. Um, he doesn't think that it was motivated by, you know, Islamophobia and the new atheism, uh, you know, kind of that he, he wrote this book in 2006-7 called God is Not Great. But up until that point, he hadn't really, um, you know, he hadn't really emphasized that. And so he doesn't think it was that. He thinks it was just that over the course of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the victory of neoliberalism. He was always a kind of anti-Soviet socialist, you know, international socialism, anti-Stalin. But once you have the 1990s, you know, the so apparent victory in the Cold War, slowly, slowly just sort of ebbed away any real confidence that socialism would be possible to achieve in a revolutionary fashion globally, that it just wasn't on the cards. And so he sort of slipped away from being connected with that. Um, and I think what replaced it in some sense is the zeal for, you know, if you can't get rid of these dictators because there's gonna be socialist revolutions in the Middle East, well, at least you can get rid of them with US military might. I mean, I think it was absurd move, but maybe that's, how it happened slowly over the course of the 90s. Professor Ann Lee? We should ask him. He's, he might be, we might be able to get him to say hi now because there's less people Could around you introduce him. me to him? Should I try that? I'd like to meet Professor Ben Burgess. That would be exciting. Okay, Professor well, I'll Lee, you, you had a question for Professor Hussein? I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty hearing. Uh, David said he wants Ben's autograph. Oh, yeah, he wants his autograph. Well, I did pick up a copy of the book, and I'll get him to autograph it and also give them an argument. So I picked up two. I'll get it autographed and send it to you, David, so you can have his autograph. Oh, my. I, I re if I could just get him on the show, that would be if you could <laughs> get him on well, was, he wasn't on the show today, was he? No, Thursday he wasn't. is usually his day, but obviously yeah. it's traveling. Okay, well, you know Professor that has to be Emily, You you had a you you were wanted to say something. Well, oh, uh, Professor Ann Lee wants you to throw your underwear. At oh, okay. <laughs> Adoring fans, yes. Well, I don't want to hijack everything here, so um, I should turn it back over to the rest of the professors and Marianne for, you know, more uh, quality and organized uh, discussion. Than no, I'm this, able is to manage. this is exciting. You're on location. This is I am. I'm, I'm reporting live. <laughs> I feel next like a journalist. We're sending, you, we're sending you to Dunboss next week, so enjoy this. I can do this uh, well, stay with us, and I'll we'll just have him say hi quickly. Okay. So there's Ben Burgess. Oh hi, David. This is the show. Oh, ben Burgess. Hello, big fan of yours. No, no, no. All right, can I hear you at all, David? No. Hi. Hi. Yeah. hi. I I heard it was a great lecture. Thank you for my product. Okay. We're watching Ben Burgess in his natural habitat. 
Please repeat them. That's it. Don't, and don't poke at them. Okay, thank you. That's great. So let's go around. Let's find out what Professor Ann Lee would like to talk about, and Professor Bick and Professor Cummings, and hopefully we can get back to Professor Hussein. This is fun. <laughs> we should just tell, tell Burgess that Charlie Kirk says hi. <laughs> anyway. Um, what are you writing over at the Daily Coast? What's on your mind? Uh, several things. It, uh, uh, I, there was a, a recent court settlement uh, uh, for the guy who sued his university uh, for... David, uh, we can't hear Anne. Are we having the... Can you hear me? I can hear you, can hear but you. Anne, uh, Anne is uh, almost a whisper. Yeah, uh, we're... Yeah, we're having um, problems today. There are technical problems. I have really? everything cranked up. Right. Everything looks okay on my end. Okay, and I do hear you, but you're coming in soft. So... Uh, don't know what else I can do. I have all the pots turned up. Okay. Can Why you don't... aim your microphone at your face? Oh, it's right... It's right here. <laughs> oh, you know, maybe the, uh, Professor Bick is right. Maybe if you point it towards you. Well, actually, I know that I, it's at the correct angle. Oh, okay. It's at the correct angle, believe me. Okay. Uh, uh, but now we can't see you. move to uh, <laughs> Professor Bick, and I'll see if I can do something else. No, no, I, I can hear you, and I think Professor Cummings, can you hear? No. You can't. No, no. Uh, why don't I... Uh, Log out and come back. Log out and come back. This is one of those Anne days. Lee has gone soft on liberals and on honor of Ben Bourgeois. Ben Bourgeois. <laughs> Somebody called him. Okay, so let's turn to Professor Bick. What would you like to talk about? Uh, hello, David. Um, I really enjoyed your discussion with uh, Professor Nolan uh, Higdon earlier in the show. He uh, underscored the importance of democracy to a cohesive and enduring society. Uh, I think he also pointed out that any elements of democratic practice that we now retain um, are under threat from demagogues, oligarchs, and a for-profit media oligopoly concerned with making a buck rather than supplying information necessary for the people to make an informed choice. Right. Uh, you know, we're told, starting when we're very young, that America is democratic. Uh, we're told that America is exceptional, due in part, at least, because of the self-governing uh, population. You know, we, we engage in self-government. However, uh, if popular policies are not turned into laws and government programs, despite years of overwhelming support from the people, then the system is not democratic. Uh, you know, one example of this would be a workable, affordable, accessible health care system for all. Uh, if a minority can consistently stymie the will of the majority, that is not democracy. If the most powerful elected official in the national government can win office with a minority of the vote, that is not democratic. Americans refuse to recognize the simple fact that the people who wrote the Constitution of the United States did not intend America to be democratic. Uh, th those people, the, the founders, as they're often called, um, knew that many Americans who had just fought a bloody revolution against the mo monarchical British Empire wanted to govern themselves. But the founders and their class felt that the masses were dangerous and not up to the task. Only men of property could assume this task, they believed, so they created a republic with a veneer of democracy, but with many anti-democratic institutions and practices that make the rule of the minority likely 
and the manu and the rule of the majority less likely as long as that minority is whom as long as the minority is the yeah the wealthy and powerful exactly um so for example the institution of the senate its members were originally appointed by state legislatures they were not popularly elected at all uh, and although we corrected that with an amendment many many decades later um, we still haven't corrected the problem of the senate which is that it's not representative that it's based uh, it's not based on population it's based on giving an arbitrary number of representatives based on a geographic subdivision of the country uh, the electoral college the ability of the president to veto the will of the majority of both houses of congress the supreme court with judges that are appointed with lifetime tenure and who quickly asserted the power to invalidate acts of congress as unconstitutional constitutionally pr protecting slavery for decades which denied millions not only the right to self-government but denied them their basic human rights America's first past the post voting system and single member districts in the House of Representatives produced a two party system that passes power back and forth between two parties that have served the wealthy minority for at least 200 out of the 233 years that the Constitution has been in place. When compared to parliamentary systems that use proportional representation to construct their legislatures, presidential systems have lower rates of voter participation and lower levels of political efficacy of, felt by the population. Most Americans do not believe that their voice has any impact on political outcomes, and they are correct. Numerous political science studies have demonstrated that the will of the average American has next to zero impact on policy. The Bill of Rights should be retained and augmented. The preamble of the Constitution, in my view, should be retained. But the rest of the Constitution should be examined very critically. The U.S. Constitution was not written by God or gods. The hands of the authors of the Constitution were not guided by deities or a deity. It was written by men full of human frailties and with material interests to protect. They also did not have the benefit of knowing what democratic practices and in institutions were best. For example, proportional representation was unknown at that time. It is long past due to democratize the U.S. Constitution based on what we know now are the best practices of democratic politics. And I say this because I think it's important to have a vision of where you want to go. And you should have basic demands, you know, that the will of the majority of people is important. And sure, you can have constitutional safeguards you know that it's that are put above the majority's will uh, you know things like basic human rights uh, most of the things that are in the uh, the bill of rights uh, i i wouldn't include the second amendment because i think that's been interpreted very badly and has not worked out well uh, but beyond that the will of the majority should be respected and i think that's the reason we're we're not having people participate why there's so much and you know and uh, apathy political apathy and disengagement from the political system and i think it's also the basis of the the rift that uh has occurred between americans because they know that whatever they do it's not really going to change the system f significantly in terms of outcomes that are going to be important to them so they engage in this I'm on this team, you're on that team mentality, and I want to hurt the other team and protect my team. That's not healthy for any society. Right. Professor Ann Lee, Professor Marianne, would you like to respond to that? I agree with you, but 
I have a couple of questions, but look, Professor Marianne, Professor Lee, would you like to? Well, there's a there's a couple of things to say to that. I totally agree. We are not a democracy, not even close, not even a democratic republic anymore. And I think the Princeton study that came out in like, what was it, 2014, pretty much nailed that down. It doesn't matter who's in office. It's the needs of the top 1%. Top 10% to top 1% are basically what prevails in terms right. of our legislature. And there might be rhetoric, the rhetoric will fly back and forth. And uh, explain you know, that study, it's because it's important. Uh, I can't, I don't think I'm the person to explain, but they should, basically what they did was that they looked at, you know, they, they, were, they looked at the polling, I believed, of what the majority of people wanted. And then they looked at the outcome. And this is over many, many years. And then they looked at the outcome and, and they, and, and they uh, I think they broke it down between lower income, middle income and high income. And I don't remember what high income was. They looked at every remember. bill that's been passed. And okay. yes, and they looked at all the legislation that had been passed. And they looked at, uh, you know, what it was, the outcome was favored by. And they found out that just consistently the top, the high, the high income group, pretty much consistently got what they wanted. And the demands, the things that were important to the lower income group, and of course, healthcare would be one, education reform, you know, help like loan, student loan debt. No, it doesn't. It didn't even matter what it was. It was that basically whatever was of much more importance to the lower and middle class did not get passed just continuously what got and they passed. decided that this was an oligarchy by every yeah. definition this is by the definition it's just like the people at the very top they get what they want doesn't matter what the makeup of the you know of the house or the senate or who's in, in in the white house there might be some marginal changes but you know overall and i think i used to think that it did those marginal changes did matter but but i think overwhelmingly what what overrides that when the uh, corporatist Democrats get their way is that we put off like Medicare for all and Green New Deal by years, decades. So you have to like, yeah, some people might get a little benefit like in the next couple of years, but how many people will die over the next 10 to 20 years because we don't have a decent healthcare, universal healthcare system in place, that kind of thing. So that's, but the other thing I wanted to say was that, um, you know, uh, we all know that it's money in politics. And I got into a lot of trouble years ago when I was still in the Democratic Party, at least nominally, when my, uh, old, my old buddy from University of Michigan, I said, bought his seat. We had John Lash was running for Congress. He ran against Congress, uh, ran against Denny Hastert and did respectably well, so much that Hastert was afraid and at one point was polling within single digits. So we have this very talented guy. He is unified. He's built up the party in the 14th district, which had been Dem uh, Republican. And the Democrats decided to go with Bill Foster because Bill Foster had $2 million of his own money to spend on that primary. And I just was loud and clear, this is completely corrupting the system when you guys do that. But we want to win. You'll win with John. But, you know, the reality was that when you have a self-funding millionaire, everybody's friends can get jobs. The campaigns are well financed. This is, and <clears throat> I don't see the Democratic Party breaking out of this at all. At all. I mean, there was a little bit of glimmer in two, in, in two respects. One was Bernie Sanders campaign. There was real hope there because he was cracking through this, you know, decades watching, you know, people fight about abortion on one hand and guns on the other. In the meantime, everybody's getting poorer and poorer. I saw the possibility that Bernie Sanders could, uh, could bridge that too. When the Justice Democrats came out and they were raising money, not from big donors, but small donors, I saw some hope there. Yeah. But they're just, they haven't been a real opposition to Democratic leadership. And the money that flows through Democratic leadership basically determines that we will never get you know, a Medicare for all or, you know, any 
action on, on pharmaceutical and drug prices or Green New Deal or student loan or anything. You know, we had, uh, then I'll go to Professor Ann Lee. Uh, we had Congressman Marie Newman on Monday's show. And I hope everybody gives to her and I hope everybody votes for her. I asked her for this group the question, you're a member of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and they are not supporting Nina Turner. They're supporting Chantel Brown, who isn't progressive by any stretch of the imagination. And her response was, well, the charter of the Congressional Progressive Caucus is we never go against an incumbent. <laughs> Our hand, and I went, oh, OK, and I accepted that. Our hands are tied. This is what the Democrats do. They say, our hands are tied. We, we, you know, I'm Pramila Jayapal. I run this caucus. I'm a progressive, but my hands are tied. I can't support Nina Turner. We have to support incumbents. My hands are tied. You know, we, we have the filibuster. We can't get rid of the filibuster. We have these arbitrary rules that we must follow. And our hands are tied. You can break every rule this is a lawless country the democrats hide behind rules and laws in order to justify not serving their constituents the the congressional progressive caucus should be supporting nina turner i don't care what's in your charter they can also change the charter yeah. Our hands are tied. There's, you have to check with the parliamentarian first. I mean, you know, January 6th showed that there are people out there that really want to tie their hands. Right. They right? brought, yes, they brought yeah. actual handcuffs. Yes, plastic handcuffs, yes. zip ties. Uh, they better wake up. This is destabilizing the country. I, this is serious business and for them to you know be hiding behind this nonsense oh but look at our charter oh well change it you're the progressive caucus then do something progressive <laughs> <laughs> professor ann lee no i i agree completely can you hear me yeah it's low but we'll fig we'll we'll work I'll with just, it i'll just yell louder okay i'm used louder to than more. usual no, I, I agree completely. In fact, the question you asked was a question that regular mainstream media should be asking these politicians in their regular uh, interactions. I mean, I, I didn't realize that there was a charter constraint within, within the caucus to, to control that. And in fact, that should be the front end question when they talk to aggressive on the air. I right. Mean, even on MSNBC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go back. To, go, go ahead, Professor Bick. I mean, you know, one would think that the purpose of a progressive caucus is to affect change in the Democratic Party in a progressive direction. If you have a rule that's adopted by the progressive caucus that says we can't challenge pro uh, incumbents, then you're not going to change the composition right. of the party. Right. That's insane. We yeah. can't challenge somebody who's not progressive. In fact, we're going to let her in to our caucus. And, and they should have real uh, uh, tests for progressivity within that progressive caucus. It shouldn't be open to anyone because they find it politically expedient for at that time to call themselves progressive. They actually have to have a voting record that shows they are progressive. Yeah. Well, Nina Turner, voting starts in Ohio when? In two weeks? May 3rd is the primary, but you can start doing mail ins, I think. No, it's now. You can start, yeah, you can start early voting now. What are we seeing? I have seen no polling so far. I mean, I've been looking for it. And it's uh, if, if it exists, I, I haven't seen it. Major newspapers are endorsing Nina Turner. So the Cleveland um, Plain Dealer, at least in Cleveland. And, and, 
And uh, she did win. She won in the actual cities of Cleveland and Akron. She won last time. It's just that they had a big get out the boat among Republicans on the Chant uh, Chantel Brown side. So, and some billionaire, you know, like oil dude is dumping million, is dumping a ton of money in the race. Oh, right the now. cryptocurrency it's, guy. It's a cryptocurrency guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he's like, doesn't like uh, Nina Turner's stance on Green New Deal. Um, you know, it's, it's not one thing, it's another. Right, right. I think that now I've, I've been in contact with some of the people that I work with. And I said that they, because I really felt they needed to be more aggressive last time. I think maybe because she was so far ahead in, in the primary season because of name recognition. But, you know, when you have a democratic machine and a ton of money, you can play catch up really fast. And now what, you know, uh, the week before, it, you know, in two, in two weeks, things, weather's getting nicer, people might be getting distracted, but it's also a good time to get people out to vote. And I'll tell you, it made, it made a difference. It's just that I wish that Akron, Ohio office was a lot more bustling with people in and out than it was. I, I know they wanted, they said they felt they had to spend a lot of money on, you know, uh, on media because of some of the garbage that, that was being spewed up. But I said, ultimately, it's getting people out of the house and voting. It's going to matter. So people... I mean, I'll probably just get in the car and go a few days, like I did last time, you know, just canvassing in neighborhoods and s sitting outside, if you're willing to do it for, uh, for 12 hours and talk to people as they go to the polls, you'd be surprised how many Democrats, Democratic primary voters, it was in, in Akron, and it's the same around here, that just vote because it's a habit. And if somebody engages them, you could change their minds. So, How horrible is Chantel Brown? Well, I mean, that depends on who you are. I mean, if you're like Nancy Pelosi, I mean, Chantel Brown is like perfect. She's, uh, she presents well, she's articulate, she's, uh, you know, she's photogenic, she's black, uh, she can raise a lot of money. But, you know, I, I don't like even making our whole wretched system about the people. I mean, it's a systemic corruption that, you know, somebody has to deliberately kind of gum up the works to stop. And, you know, speaking of which, where is the squad? I mean, there's nothing stopping individual members of the squad from being very vocal in supporting and endorsing Nina Turner. I, I mean, you know, uh, I, I think it's 13 million people that AOC her alone has. I mean, it's many millions for Rashida Tlaib and millions for uh, El Ag Omar. I mean, they could, be mo they could be mobilizing their Twitter followers to help out, to make phone calls. Where are they? Right. Now, why are they saying AOC abandoned Christian Smalls? No, I don't think, I think what it was is that there was a key uh, meeting that she had promised to attend earlier on and that they were all, you know, like hoping and waiting for her to attend. And then she, uh, she didn't attend it for some reason. It, it sounded like kind of a lame excuse that they were fearful for her safety and this and that, and she wasn't doing in uh, she was not doing in-person events at that time yet two weeks later she's over at the met gala right. so it's not that it's it's just you know um ultimately as christian small says you know we didn't need her or anybody we did it ourselves right i mean of course politicians will try to run to the top to the front of the parade but um you know, I, 
I think there's a lot of things that uh, AOC campaigned on back in 2018 that she's kind of disappointed a lot of people on, like taking the ruckus to the house, like sticking it to the leadership, like taking over the party, you know, forcing the vote. <laughs> she, she was advocating that as a, as a strategy. So, you know, I guess the bottom line is when you're, it doesn't matter the individuals when you're, in, unless you're willing, willing to really disrupt, which means you don't have a long-term career. You may be a one-term person if what you're planning to do is really disrupt. But um, if you're trying to like work the system, you're not gonna beat Nancy Pelosi. She's good at the system. And uh, for that matter, you're not gonna need, uh, you're not gonna beat any of these right wingers either. You know, they may, a lot of people may look stupid. They may sound stupid. They've survived that system. They're really good at it. Mm -hmm. Is it possible Bernie speaking Sunday out on Staten Island for Christian Smalls? Could he be a liability to union voters? I think less of it because Bernie Sanders, now, uh, I actually, I was listening to Christian Smalls uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, someone was talking to him about his appearance on uh, on Tucker Carlson's show, and it's just like, look, I mean, and I, I actually watched that, and he did not take the bait and try to make it about, you know, attack on AOC or anybody else. But he pointed out to the people that, look, you know, where we're organizing is mostly Republican. Staten Island? They're mostly, yeah, they're in a mostly Republican area. So you can't be dissing people because of who they may or may not have voted for. Uh, I have seen Bernie Sanders up in Kenosha in that town hall about five, five years ago um, with, with Chris Hayes with a room full of Trump supporters. And for some reason, Bernie Sanders can connect with people because he doesn't, he doesn't do the political thing. He doesn't, he's not, doesn't re, he genuinely doesn't regard them as basketball deplorables or whatever. I mean, right. he hears people being frustrated and angry and he actually has empathy for their pain. So I think someone like Bernie Sanders going out there will probably have a different effect of, on people than... Um, you know, just about anybody else in the Democrat. Well, he's not a Democrat. That's probably why. But I mean, I think he really cuts through that partisan stuff more effectively than anybody else. So, yeah, I think. Staten that Island, true. just for people who aren't from New York, Christian Smalls started the Amazon Labor Union. One warehouse voted to go union, I think it was last month out on Staten Island, and now another warehouse, fulfillment center, with 2,500 workers across the street. They vote next week, I believe, and Bernie is speaking Sunday. Staten Island is one of the five boroughs, and it's the only borough that consistently, with the exception of Max Rose, uh, consistently votes in Republican Congress people. It's Trump country, but we're told Bernie is you know, can win over Trump supporters. So it'll be, it'll be interesting. Uh, what would you like to talk about, Professor Ann Lee? Well, there's, uh, uh, I, can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, there was just a settlement in a, uh, in a speech rights uh, case for a, a professor in Ohio. He got, uh, a settlement of four hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars because he stood on his right to be able to misgender one of his students to uh, it's a pronoun issue and it would be interesting to see whether there will be a countersuit uh, or whether there's a uh, this is going to be used as a precedent elsewhere that's probably what what is more concerning it's a public institution uh, State University in Southern Ohio. The fellow's, the professor's name is uh, Nicholas uh, Merriweather. And in uh, 2018, uh, he decided because he uses the Socratic method in his course to uh, refer to the, the student who is transgendered by their name, but to use a, uh, a male pronoun. 
and uh, the student comes up to him after the class and says, well, you know, I don't, uh, this is my preferred pronoun, and he, he resists that, and he claims that uh, he was, he uh, got belligerent, and uh, the issue is, in a public institution, the problem was that a, he was censured, threatened, as it were, by the central administration of the dean's office, and I and his uh, his litigation was primarily on being uh, that his rights he was being discriminated against because he had the right to do whatever he wanted in the classroom. Uh, I think what and he was supported by a uh, uh, a special special interest group, um, and and so I I think if this goes any further, which I don't think it will. I think one of the interesting problems, of course, is that uh, it, the student obviously couldn't afford to litigate by herself, and the institution essentially, this was the settlement, so I don't think we're gonna hear about it anymore, but it is an interesting uh, precedent that, and especially since it took four years, and I don't think he's really gonna get that much out of the settlement will probably mainly go into lawyers fees but uh, it's being touted by a variety of, of folks including the New York Post for example that th this is uh, this is a big deal I don't think it is a big deal and, and primarily because it isn't a public institution and probably because the, the central administration overstepped their bounds but it does state it does suggest that we're going to go in this direction further on. This is another example of what you know is happening in Florida and Texas, et cetera, in terms of uh, trying to react against individual rights of students. And I wrote a thing on it su suggesting that it was really a simple, um, uh, simply a matter of disrespect to disrespect students. I mean, they have an equal right in the in the classroom to. For, for simple, basic communicative dignity. And to uh, deny that, to, to deny that in an incredibly reactionary way, and we could say that it is transphobic in that sense, and I don't know if there's gonna be litigation. Now. You know, it's usually the, the way people get driven back into the closet is that, you know, if you, if, you, if you make a federal case out of it, that is, you know, if you actually try to, to litigate at, a, at another level, uh, you can actually expose yourself to a lot more hatred. And I think it's an interesting problem just as a matter of, of a, a thought experiment. I mean, what if students on that campus started to refer to, uh, uh, you know, Nicholas Merriweather, even though he presents clearly, or at least as clear as one can as male, to refer to him as Madam. Uh, so, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I just, I think there's plenty of room for, for performance art at uh, Shawnee State. But I, uh, other than that, I think we're going to see a few more of these in the future. To what end? What is the, what is real here? Why is he doing this? Oh, I, I do think that he had a, uh, I mean, he claimed that he was doing it for for religious and philosophical reasons. Now, of course, he, uh, his own motivations, of course, were I'm doing it for religious reasons, and and there and the um, Sixth Circuit stood behind him on on saying, well, you know, the central administration is being oppressive here, and and this suggests that uh, his his speech rights were being infringed upon because. Uh, they were forcing him, forcing an ideology, and this easily challenged. I think this could be taken much further, but I think it's a question, as Marianne was talking about and as Jonathan was talking about, that it is a question of power. Had, you know, had the student ha ha had a, a lot more resources behind them, I think this would have turned into a much different case. And if it were a much different kind of university, with all due respect, it's, Shawnee is a very small university, only recently became a university, uh, it, there's and it's southern Ohio, with all due respect. Uh, it is more rural, etc. And and I think that there's a variety of other contingencies. The reality is that constitutional rights still depend on class and you know other kind of intersectional uh, categories. I, I think that's the real problem here. 
and you're going to see a lot more of this. This, this is not the first time this has happened. There's a variety of, of universities that have had these things happen, and they eventually never quite reach because no one wants to make a federal case out of it. But I, I think at some moment we have to do that. This is no different in, in that sense than the Harvard Affirmative Action case, which is problematic, as Emil has pointed out. These are all sort of asymmetric pieces of power when, when you can see this. And, uh, you know, I don't think we've heard from the students since then. We, I, in fact, I, I don't recall we actually know her name. So it, it, this is a whole variety of other, you know, uh, unintentional consequences. Uh, I, th I just think it's amazing that um, he's not willing to refer to the student the way the student wants to be referred to. I mean, and, and the idea that he's doing this because of a religious reason, he has no right to impose his religious views or practices onto students. At a public university. Or any, any university. Uh, does he? I mean... Well, the Establishment Clause would go into effect if you're using public money. Right, but even at a, at a, at a private university, why would, this, why would the professor uh, refer... I mean, what, what if he said, my religion prevents me from using your name? I'm going to make up my own name to refer to you because my religion doesn't like the name that, that your parents picked. Isn't that a similar case? I remember... A hostile environment was being created. A hostile environment. Yeah, I remember uh, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was in graduate school. I mean, professors, because university... The, the people were being um, strongly encouraged to refer to... Uh, female students by Ms. instead of Miss, or in some case, Mrs. if they knew her. And, uh, and I remember some professors used to like spit out that uh, pronoun like, oh, Ms. Cummings, do you have any, any intelligence at all on this issue? You know, they would spit it right. out like, they would say it, but they would say it with some kind of contempt. And I do remember at one point saying, yes, ma'am, back to them, or, you know, it's like, what are you going to say? You just throw it back at it. You're you're behaving like a jerk, so I don't need, I don't have to be respectful for you to you. And it was just I don't know why people, particularly in academic situations. I mean, there's certain certain uh, personalities that because they have authority in their classroom and they have a certain amount of privilege, it just kind of goes to their head, and they feel like they can jerk people around with that. And you know, it's kind of toxic. Um, you know, we, we, we had a Nolan Higdon, Professor Higdon on the show. He's written a, a book called Let's Agree to Disagree, a Critical Thinking Guide to Communication, Conflict Management, and Critical Media Literacy. And we're talking about how do you dial back the, the hostility and talk to somebody like this professor. Is it Professor Merriweather? Is there any conflict management being done with somebody like this? I try to think, what does he really want? Why, why make it harder for somebody than it already is? I suspect that a lot of parents or people who are LGBTQ don't want to be LGBTQ. They don't want their kids to be LGBTQ. And they fear that a quote unquote permissive society makes it easy for somebody to become who they really are. And if we make, if we make it harder for them to be who they really are, they will deny to themselves and others who they really are and live a miserable life of uh, self-loathing. But that, that part they don't figure. They just figure that if we make it, it's become too easy to be LGBTQ, 
So that's what's causing people to, I, I think they believe that though, right? Yeah, I know it's, it's, it's preposterous. It's like saying, oh, well, you know, if uh, we tell people that there's such thing as heterosexual sex, teenagers might actually start having urges. Right. You know, <laughs> right. you're trying to like, you, you know, you, you're trying to you, uh, question somebody's basic biological nature. And yeah, you can suppress it, but it's kind of like a, trying to keep a beach ball underwater sooner or later. It's just going to go <laughs> shooting out. You know, it's like right. even more strongly well, expressed. And, uh, but, you know, by the way, um, on the other hand, the other side of this, uh, I was at, uh, Aurora had a uh, wonderful gay pride parade in 2019 before the COVID. And some woman spoke at the uh, Indivisible Aurora and the progressives in King County were one among the sponsors of this. And I always thought it was nice. You know, I wanted to show solidarity, but I didn't really appreciate the importance of having something like this until a mother came out and spoke about her teenage daughter and, you know, how the, the distress that her teenage daughter felt be, uh, being out and, you know, never feeling safe, the nightmares, not being able to sleep. And then suddenly when you have like the whole community, including the chief of police, she was wearing, you know, rainbow balloon butterfly wings and everybody else. And even our mayor was out there, Richard. Um, it makes people feel, she said, the difference that she saw in her kid. This was after the parade. We were, you know, just having a meeting about assessing what we could do next year. And she just was saying it was night and day with that. So for the first time, my daughter felt safe because she saw the whole community out there willing to march, you know, all the authority figures willing to march. And uh, um, yeah, so I think that's particularly you know, my, my clashes with sexist professors, you know, I, I was privileged enough coming from middle class and, you know, come the, the education I had before, you know, I had an attitude by that time. But for people who are genuinely vulnerable, which is a lot of trans kids, a lot of, I mean, it was funny because uh, just uh, parenthetically, there was a, a, a colleague of mine who was cause kind of a, he was gay, but you know, it's kind of like Dr. Smith and Lost in Space. He was a uh, white, uh, he was a South African or British South African or, and you know, quite a character, but I didn't understand how traumatized he was. My boyfriend takes one look at him one time and he goes, oh, he was in the army? Oh my God, I know exactly what happened to this guy. You know, he was in that man's army and because he was gay, I mean, he got pummeled so badly, he was in the hospital for a week. And I, I, I remember my friend telling me bits and pieces of that story. My old boyfriend just pieced it together instantly because he had been in the army, but at a, well, he had been in the nuclear Navy, but at a time when gays were beginning to be accepted, it was the days of, you know, right before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And he was a submariner. So that's a very, very particular group. But yeah, he said he remembered growing up on an, army base and the way his father and his dad's friends talked about sissies. I think that's the term they used. It was dangerous. It was unbelievable how cruel people can be, you know? And still are. Yeah. And still are. Yeah. Well, anyway, what, what uh, would the, you like to talk about? Well, the only thing I wanted to say, um, uh, uh, except for something about Nina Turner was, uh, you know, so there was this brouhaha about the legislature in down in Florida, you know, yanking um, some privileges away from, from Disney World. Apparently, Disney World is its own, like, branch of government. And I'm going, I mean, so everybody is like, hey, look what they're doing to Disney World. They, I'm going, wait a minute. A corporation was effectively its own kingdom. I had Imagine the same re yes, I had the same reaction. Like, what? <laughs> so and special anyway, tax status. Um, yes, and all that kind of stuff. And I got I mean, really, I mean, if there's anybody who had their domicile, you know, in the 
kingdom of the mouse. I mean, were they subject to their laws? I mean, it was, anyway, it was just a kind of a weird little interesting tidbit. Um, and now that Alan Minsky is coming up though, I want to, uh, I want to ask him if he has had any word about polling in uh, uh, Ohio's 11th congressional district about the primary coming up. And Professor Annalee wrote in the chat room, mouse sovereignty. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own currency. It's cheese. <laughs> they don't recognize the American guy. Anyway, that was weird. Polling is hey. a great, it's a great question. Um, uh, I, I haven't, I've have not been privileged to hear, I, I haven't heard of any. I'm going there in uh, eight days, well, seven mm -hmm. days, seven and a half days. <laughs> not even that, I'm flying out of LAX at 6 a.m. next well, Friday. Let me, let me just do one thing here, because we have to, the most important thing here, as we all know, is the falafel cam. Our, yeah. And so let's go to Norway. Oh, Joe is standing by and tell us what you prepared because it was I think you've outdone yourself I had to eat defensively <laughs> Professor Harvey JK shows up right when the food is about to be served perfect timing Professor Harvey JK the food is about to, so Joe tell us what you made yes yeah, so I, I made uh, falafel with a chick made of chickpeas and fava bean with uh, cilantro, cumin, garlic, uh, chili, uh, some other seasonings, uh, fried eggplant, nice creamy fried eggplant to go with it, and then a tiny sauce underneath, and a quick pickled uh, cabbage with sumac, and also red onions and cherry tomatoes. And we can see see how the uh... wow, that looks really healthy too. Mm -hmm. is a... I haven't seen so pretty falafel since uh, that little Palestinian restaurant over in Tallahassee at Florida State University. Wow. That is pretty. And Joe, what is in that little dish on the side there? Oh, this is very special. This is, uh, we, we just received um, medial dates from Palestine. So it's Ramadan, all of the, the immigrant grocery store owners are packed with fruit and, um, and it's wonderful. So this is um, a medial date that I took the pit out and stuffed with walnut and sprinkled some rose water over. So you can smell the blossom. It's a fantastic, nice little dessert. Wow. Wow. And office hours tomorrow night, what do we have? Yeah. Uh, Yes, we, we have, um, <clears throat> let's see. By the way, it last is. night, last office hours was, for some reason, maybe I was, I don't know, but it just popped. I, I, a mm. friend of mine and I were going, this is really fascinating, the whole thing. Uh, so what, what okay. do we have? Yeah, so we have the fast lane um, at 9.30, and then around 10 o'clock, we have um, Rodrigo with apparently some issues with the left, followed by uh, Professor John and his guided tour of um, the Twilight Zone. And then Walter is going to discuss the, some, show some insights into uh, Russia, Russian life today from a few different uh, video bloggers right and then uh, we have looks like we have some two more openings and uh professor adnan the next morning with the uh, jewish muslim parables and philosophical fictions and again with uh, professor john trekking with professor john looking to the classic star trek and the valley vox uh, followed up by valley vox the cinema sin fan summer is here and um, I'm not sure what the film is by Repo Man. Repo Man. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you, Joe in Norway. Thank Pleasure. you. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. Let's go to Dave in PA, who did a brilliant, brilliant lecture on creativity. And it was interesting 
when Professor Marianne, who is a particle physicist, joined the conversation. Dave and PA is a, a woodworker, a carpenter, and you were describing how you designed a, a staircase for a, a beautiful home. It was fascinating. It really was. Thank you. Thank you. You were there. I didn't know that. And uh, what do you have? What are you going to be building today? Uh, this is a walnut uh, vanity top. Uh, I just need to uh, flush out this molding here, get my final shape in these two moldings and sand them out. So it's pretty quiet. I'll probably be scraping on this top here too. Right. And Chad? He's chilling over there. Ah, okay. Yeah. He's just stay, stay safe, Chad. We'll, we'll come back to you in about a half hour. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Marianne Cummings. Follow her on Twitter at RazorGirl. Thank you, Professor Jonathan Bick. Read Professor Ann Lee over at the Daily Co's. Annie Lee. And did we tie? Yeah, we tied on the Jack Nicholson quiz today. It is now time for Minsky and Kay. Alan Minsky joins us in Los Angeles. And Professor Harvey J.K. joins us in Wisconsin. Misky and K, they go together like PB and J. Like Thelma and Louise, like Mac and Cheese, like Sacco and Benzetti, like meatballs and spaghetti. Allen's in LA, Harvey J's in Green Bay. When they get together, they got a lot to say, cause they're Misky and K. about democracy Miss King K That's right Miss King K They got lots to say. Thank you, Professor, Professor Mike Steinel. Alan Minsky is executive director of Progressive Democrats of America, Harvey J.K., Professor Harvey J.K., is the author of countless books. Pick up, take hold of our history. That is a great book that I enjoyed. It's a collection of his essays and sermons, sermonettes, and lectures. Well, May 3rd, Ohio, Nina Turner is running for Congress and she's got the Harvey JK bug. She has really embraced Professor Harvey J.K., and the two of you have written an economic bill of rights. Let me, usually we start with Professor K., but let me start with Alan Minsky because Chantel Brown just got an endorsement, a million dollar endorsement from a cryptocurrency billionaire and the Congressional Progressive Caucus endorsed Chantel Brown, how is it looking for Nina Turner? 
who we support here on this show. You have to unmute yourself. What, what are the numbers showing? Because voting has started. Uh, yes, it has. Um, well, I don't know about that on um, poll numbers. I should could find out or try to find out. I mean, I'm sure that uh, obviously the funding, uh, the quarterly report that Nina turned in was much less spectacular than last um, campaign. I have to tell you, Nina, of course, raised uh, still probably most more money than just about any of the challengers that we're endorsing. Um, if anybody has more, I'm unaware of it. And then, of course, she also gets a lot more media than almost any challenger. Um, I mean, there's some very close races. Obviously, Jessica Cineros has, has gotten some press. That's, that was even helped out by the fact that Quare was had the FBI investigation, which unfortunately the FBI decided to exonerate him, which is terrible. Uh, it's also a little bit unbelievable. And then, um, yeah, there's one up in Oregon where a very conservative uh, Democrat is being challenged by a progressive. They, that's getting some press, but nothing, nothing like Nina can draw. So um, Nina, I don't know of any numbers, but here's something that's key to this race. I know people looked at the district and didn't think the change was considerable, but it did include um, the uh, some more diverse and uh, neighborhoods in Cleveland where Bernie Sanders actually did very well. Um, when the district did not include Western Cleveland, I believe in, in really Eastern Cleveland, going to the Eastern suburbs and down to Akron, all of Akron came out. Now the whole entire city of Cleveland is in. Well, the parts of Cleveland that are included were parts that Bernie Sanders won. And um, one of the interesting dynamics of the Cory Bush race was that Cory Bush actually lost to Clay among black voters um, and that the most liberal portions of the white metropolitan, white St. Louis metropolitan area were included in that district. If anybody knows St. Louis, University City, places like that, Central West End, that had voted overwhelmingly for Bernie Sanders. And that was what carried the result for Cori Bush. And it actually wasn't even that close. So now that Nina has um, a very liberal slice of uh, the city of Cleveland uh, included, um, I think that does mean she has a good chance, especially if she can get turnout. And on top of that, um, Nina, I think got some criticism last time for the number of people who came in from outside, very much outsiders in the communities where they were, where they were campaigning. I think that dynamic will be less pronounced in the new districts within the um, within the uh, district. So I think Nina's got a real good chance. I do think uh, the problem right now is that a ton of um, super PAC money uh, is available now for to support Chantel Brown. It's all being dropped starting now. It really didn't hit hit the billboards and hit the airwaves until this week. Now it's hitting hard. Chantel harder. Brown, Congresswoman Chantel Brown, is she as bad as we think she is? Yes, she's pretty rotten. She is in the uh, New Democrat Caucus and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. I think one thing that everybody here who does play inside the Democratic Party on the left really should take to uh, Pramila Jayapal and Mark Pocon and say, if you're in the New Democratic Caucus, you're not in the Congressional Progressive Caucus. And, you know, who do you think ideologically the people who are in both caucuses are really with? Do you think the people who fund the New Democratic Caucus are getting fooled? I don't think so. Right. Professor Harvey J.K., your thoughts on Nina Turner? Oh, uh, why is he? Oh. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Your thoughts on Nina Turner? Yeah, I don't know what happened. My my microphone is plugged in, but something maybe I came to it late. So I'm now doing using the computer built in microphone. OK, so last week when that broke about the Progressive Caucus backing Chantel Brown, I, I was I was so pissed for about 48 hours. I just I could not believe it. And I I contacted uh, Nina's campaign manager who told me that the only way to explain it is, and Alan later confirmed it by way of a conversation he had with some people, that that if you're in the caucus and you request the endorsement, you get it. It's just a standard rule. Mm -hmm. um, but what it really raises, what it really raises, it, you know, my my really incites my anger, which Alan sort of referred to, is that the Progressive Caucus 
would include folks who would be members of a decidedly non-progressive caucus. And, you know, it's, in fact, I will tell you that I retweeted somebody on how the leadership had been letting in and recruiting all these people. And I, I heard from a member of the caucus directly, you know, and uh, what am I going to say, right? It was nice to think that I mattered to somebody at least, right. but it's just outrageous, you know? You know, I, I, I've been talking to people around the country about Nina in particular, and there is a feeling, and I, I mean, this is really serious. There is a feeling that not only, do, not only do we want her to win because of her progressive credentials, but if she doesn't win, then the struggle for, for the progressive caucus will not be the same as a consequence. I mean, if you consider right now, the caucus has got plenty of non progressive folks, or at least not the kind of progressives that we need, you need someone like Nina Turner, even if she'll be a, you know, a freshman congresswoman, you need somebody like that who really has guts and, and a certain kind of dynamism and you know, a certain vision. I mean, she embraced unreservedly the 21st century economic bill of rights that we proposed, in part, of course, because Bernie Sanders had done so a few, you know, had done so a few years ago. But it's the case that she's committed to it. If one goes to her website, the very first item on her website on on issues is the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights, and it's it's crucial to have someone like that join the more lefty members of the caucus and provide a certain kind of back. I don't know if the word is right, backbone, a certain kind of stamina to that caucus. I said to Alan, the shame is that uh, that their numbers are probably not such that they could literally take over the, the whole caucus. But it is the case. It's really, really crucial. Um, you know, there, there are folks who are leading that caucus right now. You know, Pramila, it's, Jayapal. Jayapal. And also, is there a, is, what's Kana's role right now in that? Ro Kana? Yeah. Alan, do you know? You're, you're muted, yeah, Alan. Do you know? Uh, you know, he's up there, but, you know, Jan Schakowsky has a high up symbolic sounding position, but I don't think she's insignificant to its operation. And then the same with Ilhan Omar, actually, I think is the whip um, for the caucus. But, you know, as Harvey said, it doesn't, it is the largest caucus. It's larger Katie than Porter you. is the uh, deputy chair. It's, we love Katie Porter, Pramila Jayapal is the chair. The whip is Elon Omar. Where's the leadership here? I mean, these are three great, uh, it's, th it's three big, of my favorite leader. Congress people. Uh, Pramila is the transformative figure inside the Progressive Caucus. Um, it, she came in, uh, she has a background in organizing and uh, she really has driven the caucus um, like it's never been driven before. Um, and I think she deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, however, uh, uh, <laughs> she made some decisions recently that I haven't been that happy about. She folded um, on Build Back Better because she yep, got outflanked. Right. The, well, she got outflanked by the Congressional Black Caucus. They made they went ahead and made a deal on that. So you're you're, you're muted. I'm muted. Yeah, no. you're not, she, or at least she, you're not probably, loud enough. She probably I hate to say it because I am in general a big Pramila Jayapal fan. I think she probably was the key player that they persuaded, unfortunately, and she did fold. Had she not folded, I think she probably could have garnered the 20 to 25 votes to hold it up. To hold up the, the vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Yes, I believe that, yes. So, so then she's not a leader, is she? Yes, she didn't. She, didn't. she couldn't take the heat right there. So it's not leadership. I mean, to me, leadership is saying, because we had Congresswoman Marie Newman on Monday's show, and I asked her about the, the caucus, and she said what Professor Harvey J.K. said. It's written into our charter that we don't go against the incumbents. Leadership is saying, you know what? I don't care what the charter says. These are self-inflicted handcuffs. We don't, it's not 
we can change the rules as we go along. And uh, well, I mean, you know, in, in terms of in terms of the Progressive Caucus endorsement, Bernie Sanders is more famous than the collective fact of the Progressive Caucus. Bernie is endorsed Nina Turner to go back to Nina. To go back to the Jayapal thing, of course, it's doubly bad. It's not just that she folded. She folded and they were they the, the only the six members, the six core members of the squad, nobody else, a lot of friends of the family there from PDA, from Jamie Raskman to Pramila, of course, uh, Pocon, Jim McGovern, they all didn't stick with the squad. The squad were proved correct. They were yeah. proved correct by what Mansion and Cinema did. And Build Back Better is dead. It, it, in that version, it's completely dead in some now fully watered down version. Um, if, if anything, the only thing that could go forward would be a very watered down version. I mean, it's worth revisiting briefly. Yes. There were there were two tracks on infrastructure. One was Build Back Better, Bernie's multi-billion-dollar social safety net, and then there was what Joe Manchin and the Republicans want: the bipartisan payoff to corporate America, so they could rebuild the internet, roads, some bridges old school infrastructure and mansion needed that bipartisan infrastructure bill and the idea was well if you need it you also have to give us bernie's build back better and well, i want to say something i, sh I should say something just because caved knowing yeah, that he know. was going to stab them in the back and oh, not okay. give them bernie's build back better let me, let me say this about about Pramila. You know, maybe she tried to get the votes and she didn't have them, right? I mean, there there aren't that many of the House caucus who are willing to go against Pelosi. Um, but it just was my recollection. Was that it Pelosi? Who, Pelosi was the one who pulled Build Back Better and said, live to fight another day, even though a lot of Americans won't. There, there you go. But the thing is, right. is um, I can't say for sure. I shouldn't say like I have authoritative knowledge that Pramila Jayapal did not try to scrounge 25 votes. Um, but uh, is, I think it went pretty quickly. And if she did, that was some rapid fire effort to organize some votes because the folding happened pretty quickly. Very quickly. Remember, it was within about, I mean, it was a day, there was the results. It was the Virginia election and it happened right after the, I mean, who the hell responds to a friggin' Virginia election? to change the course of, you know, the, the entire operation of the U.S. Congress on by far the most important package of the entire Congress by an order of a magnitude, um, you know, just because of a friggin' election where they run Terry McFucking call up. You know? So, Professor I, RBJ, you're, you're, this is old history. The Virginia went Republican and- in, in the old expression, as Virginia goes, so goes the nation? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Professor Harvey J.K., am I wrong or is Joe Biden the worst Democratic president in your lifetime? Worse than Carter? I, this is this is no, no, Carter. Carter is still the worst. Carter is still the worst. You can hear me, right? Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> what, what is, That's Jimmy oh, Carter, I, JC I, to us. I pulled out of Afghanistan. I give him credit for that. Look, the American Rescue Plan that it, that initiated his term, for all of the inadequacies around the, the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, the American Rescue Plan was a, a re, was a really good plan to launch a presidency. Okay. And it's, it had to do with, you know, the ensuing debacles and failures. But Jimmy Carter w was far worse than, than, than Biden. I mean, f much worse. I mean, you're talking about a president who turned his back, utterly turned his back on the, on the movements and the energies that placed him in the presidency. I mean, really. And with Biden, the, the National Labor Relations Board is active right now. Okay. The big question right now when it comes to labor um, is, no, is, is equally how much energy Biden will afford labor initiatives from the White House and the administration, but also what the hell labor does. I mean, you know, 
the big question is, will labor rise to the occasion of the independent labor organizing that, that we witnessed, the worker organizing that we witnessed in Staten Island, you know, Chris Smalls and the uh, Amazon Labor Union. Um, and that's going on elsewhere across the country in Starbucks. I mean, it's, it, it's fascinating to see that kind of grassroots stuff. And undeniably, labor is still up against the wall. But the fact is that it, it may well remain up against the wall because the labor, the leadership of the AFL-CIO is way behind the workers themselves. No, I don't mean behind them as in bolstering them. They're just way back there while workers are out, out in front. You can bet the leadership of the AFL-CIO or you know, the traditional giant unions, they're worried about the jurisdictional questions and they're worried about a whole host of things, right? Um, they're not rooting for Christian Smalls. No, apparently they're not, right. And, um, and, and th what they may fail, what they're not realizing is that it's not just Christian Smalls in a New York, you know, multiracial coalition that, that, that won, that, that is the new labor movement. And if they're, if they're going to stand in the way, then, you know, the labor movement will split. It will split as it did in the 1930s. Back in the 30s, you had the American Federation of Labor, and then you had the very progressive unions, the left unions, which included the United Mine Workers, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Um, uh, anyhow, you had this, co this set of unions that ended up you know, creating this committee inside the AFL, and then ended up essentially, well, being pushed out, but really leaving the, the AFL. That became this, the CIO, and they remained separate up until 1955, I think it is. And um, you could, I could imagine a split. There have been splits along the way. Keep in mind, the Teamsters are not right now inside the AFL CIO. And, and I'm not, it's, I can't remember if the SEIU is, is in or not. I, I just don't remember. They definitely made peace with them, but they may still officially be out. Yeah. So the thing is, I mean, labor really just it, it needs new leadership, but it also needs a leadership that is re that is representative and responsive to these energies that workers themselves are, are exuding. I mean, it, it was exciting. I mean, the Amazon outcome was exciting. Yeah. You know, people say, well, that's New York. Well, it doesn't fucking matter. It was New York. They beat Amazon. Amazon invested heavily. They took they, they pulled out every stop to, to, to try to block it. And they're doing the same, you know, across the street in the, in the, what is it called? The distribution? I think it's center. the JFK distribution. Yeah. In defense of Joe Biden, as you say, his NLRB is. No, I, I, by the way, I'm not saying he was, that he's a really good president. What I'm saying no. is Jimmy Carter was far, he's the worst. Right. Alan Minsky. What I want for this country uh, doesn't seem to be what most Americans want for this country. Is this country progressive when you go out and talk to people? Oh, I'm not sure why you're saying that right now, David. Um, um, I think um, there's incredible, look, Harvey and I are working right now on our third uh, uh, in the three-part series on the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights and this one we um, cite the polling. Now, as probably everybody listening knows, over the past 45 years, one subject has consistently been ranking as the top concern for Americans. It's called the economy. And they're not saying that because they think the economy is going great. You know, so across even classes in the United States, uh, you have a sense of... Uh, um, you know, just insecurity due to the economy and a sense of being uncomfortable about how the economy is operating, how it's going to impact their lives. That's the macro economy. So, um, um, no, I don't think uh, the American people are anti-progressive on economics. They want a different economic uh, compact uh, contract with the, with the society. I think they would like something that would provide the kind of security in what is now sort of a fantasized mid 20th century American prosperity, uh, where you'd have job security, you'd have things like guaranteed vacation, you'd have uh, clear access to healthcare in a way that's affordable, uh, 
education wouldn't bankrupt you, wouldn't send you into debt, rather. Uh, housing was affordable. I think all of those things would be very popular with the general American public. Now, I do think the American public is, um, is psychologically invested in the ways in which the United States is a society in which people believe, you know, if you take initiative, you can start a company and you can do really well. And that's certainly part of the fabric of American mythology. But I think most people feel that they're blocked in any real realistic way in which they could do that. Um, so, you know, neoliberalism is always going to construct fantasies like cryptocurrency bubbles and shit like that that people can buy into. I don't think too many people are swayed by that right now. I was reading a speech by Bernie last night. He talks about an industrial policy that America insists that the government does not influence the commanding heights of our economy because an industrial policy goes counter to the free market. Bernie said, however, we do have a sub rosa industrial policy, that there is an industrial policy. What is our industrial policy? Well, did he explain what he meant by that? Because I would agree with him, but I'm not sure what he meant well, by he that. Did, yeah, mean. but but I figured I would let Professor Harvey. Yeah, I guess it has to do with the rich getting richer and, and the rest of us sort of hanging out. You know, it's funny, this industrial policy question. Yeah, I, it's a, I can now imagine what was going through the minds of my, you know, when I was a college student, the senior, the very senior professors through my grandparents. I mean, I've, I've only now come to appreciate the fact that I really have seen a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. and, and I can. You do mean shit. Yeah. I mean, look, in the late 70s, in the Carter years, I, I recall very distinctly initiatives that included, you know, front page articles in Business Week, a whole host of people, the more liberal sectors, you might say, were actually calling for industrial policy in America, right? Because they knew that Japan had an industrial policy, other countries had industrial policies. But of course, the, the Reagan New Right did not want an industrial policy. They didn't want any kind of regulation or higher taxation to make these things possible. But it's an and, they and it was the government, they say, we don't want the government picking the winners and the losers, like Solyndra, <laughs> right? That, right. That. We'll, we'll, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, you know, this whole idea of the free market is utter bullshit. I mean, it's, that alone is just utter bullshit. There is no such thing as, we know there's no such thing as a free market. Okay. Well, pretty much. Okay. These, these big corporations depend on, uh, I don't like the term, but, you know, they depend on corporate welfare. You know, they depend on the laws that are enacted so that they can call in the police if workers get out of hand. They, they depend on all of the things that government will afford for security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as long as they're the ones who benefit from it. They don't give a damn about free market. Look, you know, it's funny. It's, it's a trivial example. So I, I, I happen to have Disney Plus, okay? And when you go on to Disney Plus, it's like <laughs> you've got... <laughs> Sorry, sorry, by the way, I laugh right now because let, of the Florida news. What that might let, be. let me make clear the, the Disney Plus. The yeah, right. The, the talk about the irony, story. right? Talk about irony. When 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 Disney World was created, it was outrageous that they got exempted from the laws of the state of Florida, and now it's the it's the far right, the fascists are coming to to take away their independence and and tax exemptions. Well, yeah. So you look at on this opening page. By the way, the only reason I have Disney Plus is my wife really wanted to see Hamilton, which Disney itself was was going to, you know, broadcast. So we signed up, and then I got sort of into various kinds of things with, that I find kind of curious. Didn't it have the Beatles movie? As the Beatles movie, I just watch it for the lessons in grooming. <laughs> Well, but you look across the, and it's like, they've got the Marvel universe, they've got uh, Star Wars universe, you know, what kind of free market is there when, when literally all of major popular culture is in the hands of one corporation, right? I mean, mass culture, if you like, and it's, this is fascinating, this, this free market stuff. Well, you, you guys are, can I, Harvey and I just, uh, we were working on this thing and I, I, I wrote this one paragraph. Now it's not, industrial policy, because when we think of industrial policy, we think more of supply change, not the service sector. And I think healthcare 
broadly speaking is, is seen as more service sector than industrial. But here's what I wrote about neoliberalism and in, this is about regulation, but it could be industrial policy. In practice, government regulation still occurs under neoliberalism. Only it serves the interests of the powerful, not the people. Healthcare is a prime example. Corporate greed became so excessive, so unpopular with the public, that the government intervened and designed a program, the ACA, that protected their clients, the healthcare industry, from their own worst instincts to ensure their continued profitability and the maintenance of their political power, while the yeah, average yeah. person continued to overpay for inadequate healthcare. And I think that our industrial policy, of course, I mean, I don't know, industrial policy, there's, first of all, there's the big component of it, it's the military industrial complex. And that's obviously pretty nakedly apparent how that operates. But of course, the, the main thing is the, is the servicing of financialized capital. I once ran into a woman who worked on a wing of Arthur Anderson, and she boasted to me that her job was that hedge funds would contact them, and then they would contact corporations and explain if they could get their balance sheets in order, they could be included in these hedge funds, which would, of course, boost their stock valuations. Well, what did it mean getting their balance sheets in order? Offshore their labor or cut their costs, basically their workfare cost, their, their their workforce costs. And uh, you know, that's yeah. Arthur largely Anderson how our industrial policy operates, you know. Didn't Arthur Anderson go the way of Enron? Isn't Arthur Anderson out of yeah, business? It, it died then at that point, yeah, at the at the two thousand and eight uh, implosion. Well, we have to wrap it up. Professor Harvey J.K. is the author of countless books, including Take Hold of Our History, as well as FDR on Democracy and the Fight for the Four Freedoms. Go buy these books right now and follow him on Twitter at Harvey J.K. Alan Minsky is the executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. People should go to the PDA website and donate money and support all the progressive candidates who are out there. Thank you. I look forward. It's good to have you back, Professor K. I was going to say, it's good to see you, David. Very good. Good to see you. Alan, also good to see you. Well, Gilbert Gottfried, I think one of the funniest people who was ever born. I think most people believe Gilbert Gottfried was the one of the funniest people ever born, passed away last week at the age of 67. His comedy underwent a transformation in the early aughts. After 9-11, he told some jokes. I think in between the towers coming down, he told mm -hmm. some uh, off-color jokes. And then changed his act. I think he changed his act. Uh, it became really prominent when he appeared in a documentary called The Aristocrats, directed by our next guest and an old friend of mine, and it's great to see him, Paul Provenza, among many, many accomplishments, directed the incredible movie The Aristocrats. Welcome back, Paul Provenza. Happy to be back. Uh, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little put off by having to follow, you know, two people that know what they're talking about. about well, you know, Gilbert, really Godfrey. And, uh, Gilbert Godfrey being dead, for or against? <laughs> I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. You know what? The country is polarized, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Gilbert was a genius. There's no two ways about it. He was Absolutely. a genius. Absolutely. You know, whether you like whether you like what he did or you don't like what he did, you have to recognize that he was completely 100% singular. There's never been a comedian like him before him, and there won't be another comedian like him after him. He was a one as far as I'm concerned. Right. When did you you're uh, a little problem with your connection. When did you meet Gilbert? Oh, I met Gilbert when I first started out in comedy. You know, I actually used to see him performing at the improv when I was in high school. So he's only uh, three years older than I. And he started doing stand up when he was 15. 
So when I was 15, I was going to the improv as a, as a patron because, you know, they never checked IDs back then. You could sit right. there and order tequila sunrises all night. And um, I would go and I, and I would bring some friends of mine that I know had a really good sense of humor that I thought would get Gilbert. And almost every time that I went, Gilbert was on because Gilbert and he told me that he only found this out recently. But they used to save Gilbert from when they wanted to clear the house because he was so different <laughs> and people didn't know what to make of him that, you know, if they had 15 people left and they wanted to send the wait staff home, they put Gilbert on to clear out the room. Uh, so and I would stay as long as, you know, as long as the show was going on. So I, I saw him almost every time I went to see him when I was a kid. And then uh, when I by the time I turned 16 or 17, I started hanging out at the improv. And that's when I met Gilbert. I mean, he was there every night and um, just so funny. I mean, I can't think of another comedian that everybody quoted constantly. Everybody would just suddenly go into a Gilbert bit. They were so out of left field. And, you know, he started doing impressions. <clears throat> but what he did with them, you know, when he started doing them, we're talking like the early 70s when he started performing and he would, and was doing impressions, but that was, that was back in the days when, you know, people did impressions like, well, you know, Kirk Douglas and Humphrey Bogart and John Wayne, they all went to Hollywood high school <laughs> and their classrooms must've looked something like this, you know, and they do that. Well, Gilbert was doing things like, you know, Bob Dylan getting a heart, a haircut from Floyd, the barber, on the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he did my favorite impression of all time which i told him about my favorite impression of all time was ed sullivan going to the dentist <laughs> in which he doesn't, even do, he doesn't even do an ed sullivan impression so it's kind of like so a right drew that, friedman it's kind of like drew friedman his cartoons yeah you know, I don't. I wouldn't call them cartoons. I, I I'm just sorry. Like Jerry Bruce Friedman would draw Ed Sullivan going to the dentist. Oh, I, I guess. I right? guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, the Ed Sullivan going to the dentist bit was so funny because, he, he, like I said, he didn't even do Ed Sullivan. He would just go, Ed Sullivan going to the dentist, and then he would mind the dentist with the drill going. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's brilliant <laughs> wow. but, but you know you were talking about his his you know um transition into becoming really really dark but I, that streak was always in him it really was always in him i remember one of, one of his very very old old bits was absolutely brilliant he would just suddenly go you know i ran into jack Kennedy at a party. <laughs> and I wanted to chat to her, and I have a little icebreaker I like to use at parties. And I said, Jackie, tell me, can you remember where you were and what you were doing when Kennedy was shot? <laughs> <laughs> he always had a wicked dark streak. And we're not going to do the Coretta Scott King joke. Do not do that one. Which one is that? No, 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 not for the, not for the show, but that, you know, uh, but, uh, yeah, he was, he was something else and he was adorable. It's just really, I mean, really inventive. And he had this, you know, there was a poetry to what he did. I know that sounds, that sounds a little overblown, but there was poetry. And like when he tells the story about, you know, uh, he, he did, um, and I don't know how much of this is on tape anywhere. Cause I even, I told him shortly before he died, I said, you know, you are of all the comedians that I've known in my lifetime, you are without a doubt, the person who has created and thrown away or just completely forgotten about more material than any other comedian I know. I mean, he just hours and hours of stuff that he just stopped doing and just moved on. Um, but he used to do a thing about, you know, he was a, I, I, I was in my bed sleeping and I heard a noise on my rooftop and I went upstairs to the roof and a little spaceship landed on the roof. And I'm, I'm not doing it justice, of course, because, and a little tiny ladder came out and out came these little green men with their space suits on and they came right up to me 
And they said, Ben Gazzara is a good actor. Why doesn't he work more? <laughs> so completely out of left field. Uh -huh. Again, yeah. I'm not doing it justice, but you get the gist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody will replace Gilbert. He's irreplaceable. And I, I've been going down the rabbit hole on YouTube, watching him do local television to promote his gigs. And that is a sight to behold. I've never seen him doing local television till he died. Are you there or did you freeze? You froze. The, the gods are, the tech, technology gods are not being kind to me to uh, tonight's show. We, we had to shut down the live stream and I don't know if Paul is coming back and all right, why don't we do this? Why don't we go to Mexico? Uh, let's see if Rodrigo will, you had your hand raised and I haven't called on you and how are you? What are your thoughts on Gilbert, Rodrigo? I I felt guilty for liking his comedy, but I hear he was uh, a better person as a parent than he was as a comic. Okay, we'll come back to you. I think we have Paul back, so we'll come back to you. Rodrigo brings up an interesting point, Paul Provenza. Are you there? Yes. The, the miracle of his family, those the beautiful wife and these spectacular, these adorable, his family was spectacular. They're, spectacular. They're, it's, it's so nice to see that Gilbert found that kind of love because, you know, if there was anybody in his young days when you said oh this you know this is somebody who's gonna spend his latter years in the uh the uh home for old irrelevant comedians you know it would have been global um uh, by the way i i got a room re uh, reserved there um uh, but yeah he um his family is beautiful and i don't know if you've ever seen the documentary about yes. him gilbert but it's really if you don't just fall in love with him as a person after watching that you know you're crazy um the genius but, of Gilbert uh, was he allowed himself to be loved unconditionally, that he found Dara and, and he, he allowed himself to be loved unconditionally. And that's his, that's his genius. Well, you know, it was funny because uh, um, right around the time he started seeing Dara, uh, I took him to lunch. If you had lunch with Gilbert, you'd take him to lunch. And um, on the, we were walking back from the deli, and he was like, I have to stop in here. I, I, I want to get some lipstick for this girl. And uh, he goes into, like, F.W. Woolworths. <laughs> and he can't decide between the $2.50 lipstick or the $3.50 <laughs> lipstick. And I have to convince him, Gilbert. Go with the 350. Trust me on this. Go with the 350. Um, but it was really, it was really cute. He was like, you know, he he went with the extra, he went with the 350. So, you know, this was a big deal, as you well right. know. But, yeah. but um uh, uh after his uh, uh he came out to Los Angeles to do um, I was doing a series of set lists for UK television. And I brought Gilbert out to Los Angeles, the series out here. We shot it in Los Angeles, uh, outside of San Francisco, and here in Los, An uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and London. And I flew Gilbert out to L.A. to do the series from here. And I hadn't seen him in a long time. We just had a quiet moment. I was like, Gilbert, how, you know, how's Dara? How are the kids? And we're like, oh, great. Are, are, you, are you digging the kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations on the new kid. Yeah, that's great. They're, they're a great audience, he said, you know. <laughs> and I said, um, Gilbert are they funny? And he said, he leaned in, he goes, to be honest, I cared more for their early work. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
he was just so funny and he loved to laugh too he would laugh just as hard at you know oh yeah broken. and at his own jokes too which made yeah. it just beautiful you know? yeah but so he used to do this murray the agent character right where he would do his own like inner monologue it would be like uh he was basically uh murray the agent was the comment commenting for the audience that didn't get gilbert and they go like mm -hmm. i don't get it this is not comedy i don't know he comes up here he does what a joke where's the joke a joke is a setup and a punchline i don't see the jokes here and then you know he would go back to his act and then he'd come back as murray again and put the glasses back on as murray he'd go I, I just don't see it, you know, and then he would and he would refer back to Murray. And then at some point he would like take a cocktail napkin and put it on his head like a babushka and he would and, and the same glasses. And he'd look up and he'd go, has anybody seen my husband? He's a handsome fella. That was a lot about comedy. And it was just so unpredictable, right? And off the wall and silly and funny. But at the same time, it was so smart. I mean, he absolutely was right. a genius. I mean, right. he, can you think of anybody, uh, well known or not well known? Can you think of anybody in comedy that you could say, "Oh, Gilbert's kind of like him"? Right. I can't. Right. Right. You know, even John even Biner, John like, Biner maybe had a <laughs> maybe a bit of maybe a little maybe mm, not little. Close, not quite. But did you ever hear John Biner? No, I've thought about Charlie Charlie Callis a little bit maybe, right? but. Right. There, there's there's a big there's more differences between them than there are similarities i agree with you uh you know i mean even like some of the robin williams you go oh that's jonathan winters sped up you know it's like you can see the influence where it comes from but gilbert was influenced by everything funny he'd ever seen and nothing at all that right. those were his influences like right. he, just anything funny that he had ever thought of or ever, ever seen you know he absorbed and it turned into gilbert he, right. he was just remarkable and a sweetheart, a sweet, gentle soul for all of the darkness and, you know, all of the, you know, controversy. He was just, he was so childlike. It was, it was beautiful. I'm, I'm really, really saddened to lose yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going down the rabbit hole on YouTube watching him and it's breathtaking how, how original he is. By the way, out, um, there is a if you if you do a a YouTube search for Gilbert Gottfried and set list, you'll see a clip that we put up from the British series, which has never aired here. Um, and um, set list for those people that don't know, set list is a, a format uh, created by the brilliant Troy Conrad, uh, where a comedian goes up completely unprepared, and we give them a set list one topic at a time while they're in front of the audience they see the topic for the first time when the audience sees the topic for the first time and it's just like it's like skydiving for comics mm -hmm. and you get to see the wheels turning and you really get to identify what's this person about you know it's really great anyway gilbert did that and um he got the they topic all of the Thomas edison's oh yeah yeah oh yeah oh yeah uh and his the topic that he has there's a clip of is um thomas edison's testicle experiments <laughs> fucking hilarious <laughs> so check that one out and you, while you're in your gilbert rabbit hole i will i will uh, i think it's a duck hole with gilbert it's a duck hole. yeah 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 uh the george takai roast at the at the friars club is relentlessly yeah. horrific i don't know if you've seen that uh, I, you know what? I haven't seen it in a long time. But did you? What I what I did watch recently was: Did you see when he was the sign language interpreter for Marley Matlin at the Donald Trump roast? That is worth googling right okay. now. Do it right now. Watch it right now with me on the. It's really funny. Okay, uh, let's talk about the aristocrats. When you you asked countless comedians to tell one joke and when Gilbert was telling the joke did you know that this was hands down going to be the one everybody remembered you know when we first when Penn 
and Gillette and I first, we've been talking about doing that for years. We've been talking about, but we never really thought of it as an actual movie. We actually thought, wouldn't it be funny if we got like a bunch of comedians to just do the same joke, you know, their own versions of it. And it would be like a fun thing we can show friends, you know? Um, and we talked about it for so many years, it would become like a running gag. And then one night I was out in Vegas with him sitting at the pepper mill. And um, he just said, listen, if I commit to this, can you commit to this? Like, can we actually do this? And I was like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And um, the first, you know, two people that we talked about, because we would always talk about how funny I had heard Bob Saget do it, fucking around with friends. Uh, I had heard Gilbert do it. Pan had heard Gilbert do it. He may have heard Bob Saget do it, whatever. But the, right off the bat, we said, you know, look, if we get Gilbert and Bob Saget, you know, that's going to be hilarious in and of itself. And um, so, we, you know, we kind of knew because we knew Gilbert and we knew Bob and we knew the two of them would go the distance and they wouldn't hold back. And they're just so freaky funny. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we were surprised by some amazing, like so Sarah Silverman, I think is extraordinarily funny in it. Uh, you know, and she did a kind of meta thing where she's actually the girl in the act talking about the act, you know, <laughs> and um, and Billy the mime. I mean, who would have ever thunk? And, and Eric Mead doing a you know a card trick of it, and just there were so many funny, funny iterations of it that we just kept going. We just kept right. going and doing more and more people, and we shot people for like almost five years, um, off and on. I was leaving the country and coming back, and was you know working in Vegas, and we'd get together every now and then and do some more shooting and call some more people, whatever. And it's funny because after every um, interview we did, uh, every time we shot someone, Ken would say to me. Hey, uh, you think we got anything here? And I'll say, I don't know. I just don't know. And go to another bunch. Do you think we got anything? I don't know. <laughs> and then we did Carlin. And we came out of Carlin's office. And he goes, do you think we got anything? I went, yep. I knew right away that we had something after we did Carlin. I knew that he had given us a spine where, you know, where we could work from. So it was really, I mean, you know, it was. we never set out to make a movie. We never thought it would be, you know, a full-length thing. We never thought anybody would be interested in it except you know lunatics um and it just turned into something else you know but his his philosophy of it all all along was you know jazz he was like you know we get to hear the same we get to hear musicians do their version of the same song and there's standards that everybody does you know and he goes you never get to do that with comedy because comedians don't want to do the same thing that other people are doing right what if you know and that's what set us off on it and we knew and there aren't a lot of jokes that are you know totally free there's not a lot of jokes where the setup and the punchline are the same and then you could just got an open wide open field in the middle there's not a lot of them like that right so yeah we just landed on that one and and gilbert you know it's an interesting thing because people think people think that the movie was inspired by gilbert at the friars roast for hugh hefner where he did the 9-11 joke. But the truth of the matter is, if you see the movie, before you see Gilbert at the Friars Roast, Gilbert's doing the joke around a conference table, which is where we shot him in a hotel. And we did that like, you know, a month or two before 9-11. Really? Yeah, maybe maybe even longer. Um, so you, when 9-11 hit, you were thrilled and dancing. We have, this is... A big opportunity. No, but that's the funny thing is that, you know, Gilbert inadvertently gave us a third act. Mm-hmm. That we had, we had been working on a movie and we shot Gilbert and we knew that he was hilarious and we knew that that was going to be funny. But then after the Friars roast, I got wind of the fact that Gilbert did the aristocrats joke there. And, um, you know, we believe that the reason he went to the aristocrats joke was because he had just spent a whole day doing it with us and it was like fresh in his mind or it was just you know he had gone to such depths of depravity with us that he thought i'm in a hole i may as well just dig it as deep as i can right what's the most you know depraved thing i can do right now oh yeah the aristocrats came to his mind so um we had already been working on the movie you know before he had done that roast and before that whole incident happened um but without realizing it he ended up giving us a third act (laughs) <laughs> it gave us almost a raison d'etre for you know why we talked about this movie for 90 minutes <laughs> so offensive humor is the aristocrats joke offensive 
it's dirty, but is it offensive? You know, I don't know. I don't know. And I don't even know if, it, you know, like, I don't even know if you get away with it now. I mean, if I tried to release it now, I don't know. I don't know. Everything's different now. And, and, and people don't seem to be able to let go of, of all sorts of stuff but, to yeah. just enjoy a joke anymore. You know, I mean, I mean, is the, is the joke racist? Well, sometimes is the joke sexist. Sometimes does a joke involve pedophilia? Yeah. Sometimes does a joke involve bestiality. Sometimes does a joke involve horrible diseases. Sometimes I don't know. <laughs> it's, you know, but that's the beauty of it is that, you know, you can go into something that's so, you know, dark and ugly if it were real. And it's just about joy and light, you know, uh, when you're just having fun. But you, you got to have the right mindset. I don't know. It's a, it's a, very, I don't know. Can you understand anything now about what, what is? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have a room filled with 300 people. And one asshole is heckling and, and they tend to dictate the comedy. One person is saying, I don't like this. And 299 people are going, oh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take our orders from you instead of the comedian. That's except what's happening. That, except that's happening on Twitter with millions. Yeah, but Twitter isn't real. And half of Twitter are bots. Twitter doesn't make money. It's not profitable. Twitter is a mirage. Yes, but I'm, I'm talking about in terms of like, you know, comedians who do something that's misunderstood. It gets, you know, repeated and, and, and reframed over and over and over, you know, and it becomes like, you know, well, you need to be in the room. You know, Bill Burroughs used to say it's like, you know, one person with a blog can suddenly change everything because you said something that pissed off one person, but that person right. has a blog and the blog gets picked up and blah, 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 blah. And so I don't even know what's offensive anymore. I, I don't even know. I mean, uh, and you know, I think it's, I think it's good that we uh, are uh, aware and, um, um, you know, trying to, uh, deal with things like misogyny and racism and homophobia in comedy. I think that's great. I think that's a conversation we should have been having, you know, for pretty much all of civilization. Right. Um, I, I think that's all great. But somewhere along the line, it seems like a lot of people have foregone the fact that it's just art. It's not real. You know, I mean. Well, uh, pedophilia is wrong. Which is why it's funny. I uh, going out on a limb here. Really? <laughs> well, that's the thing. That's you see. That's also you know racism was funny to people who were past the conversation. To people who like you know. Uh, uh, let me make it easier. You know, you make a Hitler joke because you make Nazi jokes. Nazis were like the go-to. You know, well, now there's actual Nazis and they're right. actually doing things, you know, that matter. So that's not so funny anymore. And, you know, it's just sort of the edges have shifted and moved. And it's it's crazy. Did you ever think that in your lifetime you would have to be dealing with Nazis? Did you ever think that Nazis would be a thing again in your lifetime? Yeah, I work for John Stewart. <laughs> the uh, although hitler was an original thinker uh <laughs> that's not fair so well what uh, was the thing uh what, what was you saw the thing that jimmy carr got in trouble for right well jimmy carr gets into trouble though that's his thing you saw did you see the joke that he did that got got him into a, a, like a lot of trouble what? recently uh, how Just much he, trouble can he get into he's beloved in great britain what, what kind of trouble well now now I don't know something, not so much. No, I, I'm sure he'll overcome it because no, there is no such thing as cancel culture. That's just, that's all a canard. Right. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, he did a joke about how, you know, uh, people always talk about, uh, you know, how Hitler, um, Hitler killed 6 million Jews and he killed this and he killed 2 million Romani. And he goes, but people don't talk about that because people don't like to talk about the good things he did. <laughs> That's funny. 
It's hilarious. But, you know, you and I know right off the bat that that's absurd. Right. But, you know, somebody, a lot of people heard it and said, oh, that's, that's really horrible and it's really offensive. Well, he probably shouldn't have done that. He knew better. I mean, there are things you, you kind of know that that joke is going to upset people. You know, it's funny because I always wondered, like, what group did he, you know, did, what groups did he not, did he choose right. not to do? before he didn't land it on Romani. Right, right. <laughs> People have a right to tell any joke. People also have a right to be offended by any joke. And I think this is what keeps comedy going. The converse, This is the conversation we need to have about comedy and what makes it so interesting. What is funny and what is offensive? And I hope we never resolve this. This is not to be resolved. It's an ongoing, fluid conversation. I got to tell you, in my lifetime, I've never seen comedy get as much attention as it's gotten lately. And I've never seen it really understood by so many people as a real art form. Like, that's huge. That's huge. Right. <clears throat> I'm 64 years old. When I was a kid, starting out, hanging at the improv, nobody used to think of it as an art. I mean, comedians did, but, you know, the, nobody in the public thought of it as like a real art form. I mean, you know, I think you can teach courses on it the way you teach music appreciation. I think you can do that with kind of with stand up too, you know? Uh, um, but that was never anything that was uh, generally understood by, you know, the average audience, but it seems to be that comedy has really, has really gotten some respect, enough respect for people to get upset. Well, comedians are good comedians are dangerous because they get to the point and if they're talented, they say things that reveal something about the zeitgeist that's unsettling. That laugh is unsettling because it reveals something about all of us. And it's the laugh that people are afraid of. You know, well, you know, Carlin, you know, the great quote by Carlin, he said, the job of a comedian is to find out where the line is, deliberately cross it and bring some along with you who are happy they came. Right. Right. But it's also to simplify things, to to make things digestible, to explain why we are where we're at. I was reading about Orwell and he was complaining about the left, how they talk in highfalutin terms and they care more about this is george orwell complaining that socialists and people on the left rather come across uh being smart than actually selling the idea of solidarity and collectivization and he said you're more likely to uh get a clear understanding of socialism from a music hall comedian than you would an academic. Well, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, that's another thing that Carlin used to say. He used to refer to himself as a vulgar comedian, vulgar from the sense of the people, of the people. The know? vulgate. The yeah. vulgate, exactly. Uh, and, you know, he used, to, he used to talk about how comedy is really a very populist thing. And um, he being, you know, coming from a working class background, you know, relates to people in a different way. But I always said that, you know, um, comedians know more about the tenor of, of the country, I think, than certainly any politician or any government official does. I mean, because we, first of all, we have to figure out how to talk to everybody in the country. Uh, we have to talk about, you know, we have to figure out what they, we have to know what they believe before we can subvert it or refer to it. We have right. to talk about what they know. You know, we can't talk about something out that they're completely ignorant of or, or, or aren't hip to in some way. So we have to speak to people in a way that's really approachable and really accessible. Um, uh, and on top of all of that, we interact with every social class all the time. Right. We're on planes, we're in cabs, we're talking to audience members, we're, you know, we're dealing with Fund dealers, we're dealing yeah. with press, we're dealing with, you know, you get meetings, all this, it's just a huge cross section, you do corporate gigs, and all of a sudden, you got friends who are millionaires and billionaires, you know, uh, um, it just, I really feel like if you really want to know the tenor of a country, 
you know, the comedians are the ones who can tell you what this country is really all about. Is the subject matter for a comedian limited? Are there certain, are there, is there an Overton window? I don't mean Rick. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's, we're back to Gilbert again. I mean, I don't think so. I think if it's funny, it's funny. Um, but can you talk, you can, you can do pedophile jokes within reason. You can do sex jokes. You can be disgusting. But can you talk about everything? And, and I don't mean like, uh, bestiality i'm talking about you know tackling uh climate change i i don't see why not i mean i used to get in a lot of trouble i did a lot of religion material you know i have the religion to me is like one of the stupidest things on the planet uh and i used to do a lot of material about it and i used to do a lot of material about catholicism since that what I, that's how i was raised and um, I used to get a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. Um, but there was there was no you know there was no Twitter at the time. But I, I remember you know I, I got spit upon. You know people really upset about me saying things about the Pope or, or some shit like that. You know and about you know I would just talk about the pedophilia in the church as you know as if I made that up out of thin air. You know and people would get really upset. Uh, um, so I think there's always going to be people who get upset whenever you do anything that's in any way incendiary for somebody, you know, I think it's, I, I think you're going to piss some people off. But um, most comedy that you see is about relationships, sex, growing up, their personal stories. Yeah. Right? The, that's that's the trend that. in comedy now is very confessional. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, this is great. I, it's great to see you. And I, and I, yeah. Who do you like? Who, what comedians out there? Boy, you found Bo Burnham. I remember 10 years ago, we were working on Green Room and you kept telling me about Bo Burnham. Like nobody knew you found him before anybody I, else did. Yeah. Boy, was he, a, is he a multi talent or what? Boy, he's remarkable. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I haven't been out uh, interacting with too many comedians lately, given pandemic and all. And I haven't been uh, to any of the festivals lately, but um, there's a few people out there I like. Uh, I saw this kid the other night, actually. My, my first night in a club in years. Um, his name is Max Beasley. So interesting. So interesting and clever. And also there's, there's a whole bunch of layers to him right now. Uh, he's sort of kind of like kind of emo Stephen Wrightish kind of like line writer but he's also uh transitioning from male to female and he's doing material about that but it's not confessional it's really funny jokes he's not calling it a segue he's not, he's not you know it's not like a Hannah Gatsby kind of thing at all he's literally just doing great set up punchline jokes about it so right. interesting he's really good wow really. i'm gonna keep my eye on him for sure i want to see him again or her who yeah. knows if you see him, if you wait long enough it'll be her right right comedy it's not quite back yet is it because of the COVID. um it seems to be here in la it seems to be i mean i, I um yeah it seems to be <laughs> I was in some rooms that had some, you know, some people in them. I don't think I, I don't think everything's back yet. I mean, it's a little weird. I mean, there are a lot of people who are really hesitant, and and there's this new wave coming of uh, what's it called? The new the new strain. Wow. Uh, um, so I think a lot of people are hesitant to go out. But but actually, the the three venues that I've been in recently, three or four venues that I've been in recently. Uh, they all ask for proof of vaccination uh, before going in and and they let everybody take their masks off. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Either. Are we it's done crazy. with this pandemic or are we just tired of it? Is it over or we just we just got bored? I have a feeling we got bored. I have a feeling it's now just going to be a chronic condition that and it seems to me everyone I know is getting it. 
And it's not as bad, you know, because of the vaccines and the boosters, right. they say it's not that bad. But I think a lot of people are just, I think we've given up trying to control it. I think the right wing, I think DeSantis and Joe Rogan won. And well, you know, uh, I'm okay with that as long as they're still giving out vaccines because. Right. You know, and as long that's what it's going to be like, like a flu. They say it will be endemic and it'll be like a flu and you get a seasonal shot or whatever. But um, you're you compromised. Uh, right. Unless you're morbidly obese, like half this country. And like pre- half this country. Diabetic. So if you're yeah. young and you're in shape, it's just like the flu. And the... Anyway, uh, to be continued. Come back. It's good to see. I, I'm you. gonna. I'm gonna miss seeing people getting duct taped to airplane seats, though. That that was really entertaining. I know. <laughs> I, I think that'll still go on. <laughs> I hope so. I hope we don't. I hope we don't throw the baby out with the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love you, Paul. It's great to see you. I love you too, David Feldman. Come back and come uh, back more often. To Gilbert. Long may his comedy live. Right. When's the next funeral? Who's next? That's why I spoke to Jeff for us. Uh, I'm not feeling that well. Um, All right. I, <laughs> anyway, doesn't it seem like this year is like an Agatha Christie novel? Who's killing comedians of the comedy boom? I'm Holy telling shit. you, eventually my phone's going to start ringing again. I. <laughs> <laughs> this, this game is about attrition. <laughs> I had one joke that I didn't have the courage to tell, but I'll tell you. When Louis died, Louis Anderson, I said, they always die in threes. <laughs> and and oh, somebody, said, I, somebody said he would have loved that joke. I said, I can't. I, I, I'd feel. Oh, bad. he would have loved it. I know. I know. Well, my joke about when Gilbert died, when Gilbert died, I wrote to another really good friend of him, and I said, well, he finally picked up a check. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah yeah all right we love Thank you gilbert you. well yeah we love gilbert i love you and come back soon not for to remember somebody who passed somebody uh, let's talk about people we wish would pass that's let's more- do that show let's do the yeah. people who should get who should have been <laughs> That show will go on for hours. Go do fantasy in memoriams. Let's sell that to like, you have connections, fantasy in memoriam, where we just remember people we wish were dead. Wish we're dead. And we bring them on as guests. Oh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. I wish you owned a network. Go, you, but you sell shows. Why don't you pitch that? We're, you yeah, know, you see all my shows on the air now? You see you them gotta, all? You got to, you're better at it than I am. <laughs> you and I, we're, we're still here together now, aren't we, David? Yes. Yes. I love you. Thank you, sir. Love you too. I'm going to bring you on with John Ross. When it, you, oh, with, man. I haven't when spoken to him in ages. God, he's funny. Yeah. Let, let's do that. That would be fun. That would be fun. Okay. All I'll right. see Let me, you. Thank you. Let me say goodbye to your viewer. Bye. <laughs> Let's talk to our viewer. I love that Rodrigo is our viewer. We, unlike every other podcast, we I talk to my one viewer. That's great. Let's talk to our viewer, Rodrigo. <laughs> Rodrigo is our viewer. I love that. Hi, viewer. Hi, there. You are the one person who actually listens and watches the show. What's on your mind, viewer? Uh, I will try to go fast because a uh, headache is killing me. Uh, half, the, half the world, they say, has headaches. Do you remember a few years ago when uh, on Spin City that the mayor was making a uh, a speech and he tried to... You're talking about Spin City? You're talking about Spin City. 
Yes. Do you remember that the mayor desperately tried to avoid insulting people and he ended up talking about how half the city became angry and emotional every month? Uh, you know what? I was reminded of. Yes. You know, I've never really watched Spin City. So I'm Michael J. Fox, right? Yes. Gary David Goldberg, Tom Hertz wrote that show, but I, I don't think I ever watched it. But, uh, uh, anyway, uh, in the last few months, the cottage industry of trying to read the mind of Putin, that madman, that mania has been supercharged. It is revealing, at least for leftists, that the liberals trying to guess what Putin is thinking have gone from there's no new Nazis in Ukraine to there's only a few thousand openly new Nazi soldiers in Ukraine's military to the several new Nazi parties in Ukraine failed to reach 5% to become registered because they refused to present a single party for voting, but hey, it counts, I guess. Uh, but even the liberals willing to acknowledge that Bush promised to stop expanding NATO and most presidents from Clinton to Obama were happy to expand NATO insist that Putin is a madman and we have to protect the Ukrainian people. Why are the Ukrainian people different from all the other victims of genocide and war refugees that most of Europe and the UK have been dragging their feet on accepting for decades, including the 5 million refugees that Turkey is keeping in 10 camps because Europe promised Turkey would be accepted into, into the European Union if they kept the darkies from crossing into white Europe. Well, if you refuse to accept that you're a racist, there's really no reason for Ukrainian people to deserve protection from Putin when there's a long list of countries oppressing their own people whose entire existence Western media only rarely remember. But back to Putin, the same liberals who tell us he's a madman, a maniac, a thug, and an autocrat refuse to ask themselves what could have possibly set him off. If we list the likely reasons for Putin to do what he's doing, we can forget the Nazi in Ukraine because Putin has dropped it from his list of demands, but mostly because no one in the West really cares about how many new Nazis are in Ukraine or the rest of Europe. Among the other reasons, Putin believes in climate change and Ukraine has some of the best farming land in Europe. Putin would like to have a port or two to have more sea access to the Atlantic. But a very important reason liberals refuse to accept has any relevance to the situation is that Putin is a paranoid so-and-so who was trained as a spy in the old KGB. Less than a decade ago, Putin was still saying nice things about NATO because he expected that eventually he would be allowed to join NATO, despite all the times a US president signed off on accepting a new European country into NATO. Today, he decided to move first because he fully expected that the establishment would try to bring Ukraine into NATO. Why am I talking about this? Am I saying I can read Putin's mind? No, I cannot. I have no proof of what Putin actually wants. But you know who knows? The Obama-Clinton people running Biden's White House know what Putin wants, have known since last year, and they're determined to not let him have it. Not because they can't afford to, or because it's immoral, or because the military-industrial complex doesn't want them to, but because their polling suggests they don't have to. Which brings us to the difference between people who are anti-war and demand an end to hostilities from both sides, and those who claim they're leftists, but have clearly chosen the side of the quote-unquote Ukrainian people. What happens when you put the Ukrainian flag on your Twitter bio? Are you signaling to the establishment that you've seen through their game and you're on the right side of history? Or are you surrendering your moral agency to NATO 
demanding that Putin be stopped no matter the cost. Perhaps an example will clarify the situation. A streamer I follow is quote-unquote defending Ukraine. She claims she's an anarchist who hates the establishment. She was yelling the other day about F NATO and maybe the UN should be dismantled and the money used to feed people. But she's still on the quote-unquote defend Ukraine side, which means she's okay with funneling money and weapons to Ukraine which does nothing except make this war last longer. Maybe we shouldn't be talking about Zelensky surrendering, even though the longer he refuses to surrender, the more people die, especially since, as this streamer points out, many people are currently being oppressed under Putin. But if we refuse to even entertain the idea of Zelensky surrendering to Putin, we're just falling in line with the West demanding that Putin be stopped no matter the cost. I'm not asking anyone to choose between putting dozens of flags on their Twitter bio or none. I'm not even asking anyone to accept their instinct to protect Ukraine from Putin that somehow doesn't include people from Yemen, Ethiopia, Somalia, Myanmar, etc. is rooted in unrecognized racism. I want everyone to realize that when they openly take the quote-unquote defend Ukraine side, they have surrendered to the side that wants to keep shipping weapons to Ukraine until next winter forces Putin to the side if he's retreating or trying to hold Ukraine during the winter, civilian casualties be damned. And I don't want to change what I wrote over two weeks ago, but I will point out that even a few leftists who support shipping weapons to Ukraine are outraged at the Israeli soldiers who bullied old women at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Where is the leftist outrage from all the people with Ukrainian flags on their social media? Or at the UK sending women to single white males, but the rest to Rwanda, which is currently so fascist, four Rwandans received asylum in the UK just last year. It should be clear that the Ukrainian refugees are white, when NATO wants reasons to send weapons to Ukraine, but they're Eastern European when the UK tells them to go apply for asylum in Rwanda. I don't know if there's time for a Mexican update, but it's pretty entertaining. The quantum president is claiming that he won the vote, that he was short on votes on again, and at the same time the politicians who voted against the Bartlett law are traitors to the nation again. And breaking news, the female Mexican SCOTUS minister appointed by AMLO has protected the Mexican FBI from having to hand over their investigation into the president's brother to the Electoral Institute. And I'm done. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rodrigo, my listener and my viewer. I knew there was somebody out there who actually watched this show. We will be back. Uh, I'll wrap things up, but first we have a special uh, cameo from Rudy Giuliani. Hey, this is Rudy Giuliani, America's mayor. I'm still coming off the high of covering George Thorogood's bad to the bone while dressed as a jack in the box in front of an enthusiastic Jenny McCarthy, whom we all masturbated to in the 90s. That was before technology ruined masturbation by making it too easy. When I was mayor, we all masturbated to the same people, centerfolds, Bond girls, and barely legal pop singers. It was a shared communal experience. And back then, Asian people were polite. When we covered George Thorogood, <laughs> they would bow, not walk out. Technology has ruined masturbation, empowered minorities, and rigged elections. Anyone with ears can tell you that my singing last night was far better than the Polaric Sphincters or the Cornfield Turds. <laughs> but it was me, the Jack in the Box, who got voted off while the Polaric Sphincter and the Corn Pack Turd lived to sing another week. Believe you me, this is not the end. Today, I'm announcing a class action lawsuit to suspend any further episodes of The Masked Singer until this is resolved. <laughs> That's right. As of today, I am suing 
and masturbating to <laughs> the cast and crew <laughs> of The Masked Singer. <laughs> God bless America. <laughs> That is a that's an official statement from uh, America's mayor Rudy Giuliani. I think that's Rudy Giuliani. Some people are writing and saying it's Robert Smigel, but I think it's uh, Rudy Giuliani. Thank you to all our guests, including Nolan Higdon, Professor Nolan Higdon. Pick up his new book. Let's agree to disagree a critical thinking guide to communication, conflict management, and critical media literacy. Thank you to the Hershenfelds, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld and Ethan Hershenfeld. Uh, go download Thug Thug Jew or stream it on YouTube. Emil Guillermo, thank you. Follow him on Twitter at Emil Amuck and read him over at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund and listen to the PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn, go to barrywlynn.com for a treasure trove of his sermons, writings, and appearances on various television shows and podcasts. And pick up D. Knight's book, uh, my Whirlwind Lives, Navigating Decades of Storms, a Political Memoir and Manifesto, published by Guernica World Editions. That is uh, coming out in June of 2022, but you can order it now. Thank you, Professors Marianne Cummings. Follow her on Twitter at Razor Girl. Professor Jonathan Bick, come to office hours tomorrow night and watch him teach us about the Twilight Zone and Star Trek. Professor Ann Lee, read her over at the Daily Co's. Her handle there is Annie Lee. And of course, Professor Adnan Hussein, watch his podcast or listen to his podcast, Guerrilla History and the Mudgeless Podcast. Thank you, Alan Minsky, Executive Director of Progressive Democrats of America. And of course, Professor Harvey JK. Follow him at Harvey JK on Twitter and pick up, take hold of your history. And the brilliant Paul Provenza. Follow him on Twitter at Paul Provenza and go stream the aristocrats. Thank you, Joe in Norway, for your falafel calm. Com, Cam, and uh, Dave and PA uh, for doing uh, what you did tonight. Follow me on Twitter. Friend me on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel. This show is put together by the brilliant Sarah Bush, Grace Jackson, Hannah Feldman, Andy Brown, Professor Jonathan Bick, Joe in Norway, Dan Frankenberger, and the Invisible Ninja. Thank you to all of them. And that's our show. I'm David Feldman. David, Come to yes, sir. Please remind your viewers to sign the petition for Melissa Lucio, who is in dead row in Texas. Uh, she would be executed on the 27th. Right. Uh, Kim Kardashian and France, the country France, have asked that the execution be stopped and the current DA has promised that he will ask the judge to withdraw the death sentence, but that would only take her back to serving life for the murder of her two-year-old, which she did but not that's give better her. than that's better than what we were told by Professor Bick on Monday. That's good news, isn't it? Well, it's not sure yet, so the more activity there is, the more likely it is that she will actually be spared. Thank you. How do you sign the petition? Uh, go to the Innocence Project and look for Melissa Lucio. There are links to the petition there and to share on your own social media. Right, the Innocence Project. Thank you for that. Rodrigo. 
I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. We got porcine hysteria in the greater Bay Area. We heard about it on CNN.com. I guess they're calling it a swine bomb. We've been infested by feral hogs. They messed up my lawn and they ate my dogs. They're taking over and they're out of control. We're gonna organize a swine patrol. We got a swine bomb. We're doing the swine bomb boogie. These hogs are smelly and they make nasty sounds. Some of them weigh close to 800 pounds. Now you tell me if you think I'm mistaken. I think that sounds like an awful lot of bacon. These critters are mean, they can tear into you. Here's what they say you're supposed to do. Get on your car or climb up a tree Cause pigs can't climb, at least that's what they tell me We're in a swine bomb Pigs can't climb Doing the swine bomb boogie Pigs can't climb Folks are getting guns and shooting them on sight I doubt if Peter thinks that's all right all my life I've been for gun control Now they done put me on swine patrol Pigs can't climb and white men can't jump All we can do is a bump a dee bump Can we chill these pigs out with some smooth and metal jazz Round them all up and send them to Alcatraz We're doing the swine bump boogie Pigs can't climb. We got a swine bump we're doing a swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. Pigs can't climb. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. We got a swine bomb. Pigs can't climb. We got swine hogs all over the place. We're doing a swine bomb boogie. Pigs can't climb. I don't know what we're gonna do. Pigs can't fly. Seems like we're gonna need the jigs can't fly. The pigs can't fly.